Hey everybody, I'm here with Lagspike776. Hello. You know he's a real Fire Emblem head because he has the Thracia number in his name. Oh yeah. And he's done his own uh, videos on uh, Fire Emblem Fates, and he asked me just recently to do a skills tier list with him. So okay. without further ado, I'll turn it over to him and he'll introduce what we're doing. Before before we get this started, I need to make something completely clear. I, I'm not a Fire Emblem Fates player, I'm a Conquest player. So if you come, uh, I, I just wanted to make that clear. So I'm not liable for any bad opinions I might have about Birthright or Revelation. So, okay, now that that's uh, down with, um, yeah, no, uh, I came up with this idea actually as it, it stemmed from the most unlikely place ever. I was writing a script for another video. I asked Zoran for help. He, being a nice guy, uh, decided to help me out. It made my script a lot better. I had a part about skills and I rated them all them all and uh, uh, like he told me that it was probably not a good idea i realized that it was probably not a good idea and i decided to can it for a later day and seems that that later day is today i'm so excited to get this party started uh here we have all of the uh non-dlc non-amiibo non uh what is it uh path bonus class uh skills and uh we're going to go through them and we're going to rank them from meta defining always worthwhile nice to have niche and bad uh, I'll let Zoran explain what the tiers are. All right. Um, so I think we have a we talked through this a little bit, uh, and we've sort of come to a consensus about what these mean. Uh, I would say that meta defining really is it's what it sounds like. These are the kinds of skills that would that you'd always want to play through, or you'd always want to have in a build, depending on the objective of that build, like. On a damage dealing build, you might want to, like a lot of damage stack. That's one of the fundamental concepts in Fire Emblem Fates and Conquest specifically, if we're limiting ourselves to that. Always worthwhile. Th those are the kinds of skills that um, they're worth the effort to get. And that could mean uh, you go out of your way and you like do some class changing to get them. Or uh, if they're like a support skill, you want to have at least one copy of it on your team so that you can use it on your teammates. But they're not essential, really. Uh, nice to have just means they have a positive effect. If you, if you come with them or they, you get them on your way to whatever you're completing your build with, they're, they're great. You appreciate them, but you don't need to go out of your way. Your run isn't made or broken by whether you have these skills or not, but it, it's very nice to have. Mm -hmm. uh, for niche, uh, I would just categorize those as things that they do have a particular purpose. Uh, you can imagine a scenario where you can put them to good use, but there's never a, a, a situation you're facing in the game where they're necessary or that you particularly miss them. Yeah, or maybe it's a skill that... Uh... It, it can be put to very good use, but only in a very small, specific portion of the game. And uh, maybe going through the trouble to acquiring that skill isn't, uh, isn't maybe worth the return that you get. Sure. And then bad skills doesn't necessarily mean that they'll actively hurt you, although I can think of one that I would argue does. Uh, but they're the skills that just never really do much for you. And you're never going to see much return on them. Yeah. Um... All right, uh, let's get started. So we're going to be splitting this up into unpromoted classes and promoted classes. So starting off, we have uh, from nobility all the way to uh, even, uh, sorry, uh, is this, yeah, this is odd shaped, sorry. Uh, it's a bit hard to remember that this is even handed, this is odd shaped. It's, there's the same skills, but they, the game pretends that they're different. Uh, and the second part is going to be all the way from Dragon Ward to, uh, I think this is even better, but I might be wrong about that. Again, nobody, I, I, don't think, I don't think anybody really cares about the minutia of what, what the two exact same skills that just happen on different turns do. I remember that the odd ones are on wolf skins because for Valoria to use it on endgame, you have to do it on turn one or turn three. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Endgame planning. God. I remember, I remember oh, yeah. spending like hour, uh, an hour trying to figure out stuff for my series. Anyways, uh, yep. let's get started. This is, this is no... So the plan... The, oh. the plan for us is to uh, split this video in two. So the, uh, part one will be on my channel, and then the, the follow-up part two with all the promoted class skills will be on Lagspike's channel. Oh, yes, of course. And the link will be in the description. 
Yeah, I think I think. Uh, okay, I, I I I'm sorry. I thought I said that, but my memory is uh, it's it's famously terrible. So uh, let's get this party started. Uh, this is uh, this is nobility. Nobility is nor prince nor princess. Uh, it's a level one skill, so uh, it gives you a 1.2x multiplier to all your exp. Personally, I would put this into uh, I, I would put this into borderline always worthwhile or at least nice to have because the way I see it is that it's there are it you are it is going to be so late in the game until you do not have a skill slot for this for the skill. I find that like until like chapter 20 or something, I, I always have at least a, a one skill slot that I can give to nobility. And it makes my it makes the EXP curve a lot more forgiving. I often don't promote my corn until like level 17 to 20 because corn doesn't really need the stats. And this makes your life a lot easier getting to level 20 and just uh, promoting. It, it, it might see it, it. It's not necessary. Those stats might not always be necessary, but it's just a very nice thing to have. And. I just find that it helps me. Uh, Zoran, what are your thoughts on nobility? I'd put it uh, pretty firmly into nice to have. Uh, the way the experience curve works in this game, at least on Lunatic, the, the difference between 120% and just regular experience is not actually that big, especially because the rounding works against you. So uh, like if you're going to get 8 XP, then with nobility you get 9 instead. Um, so the actual effect is generally that it lets corn stay like one level farther ahead of the curve than anyone else can, which is worth like half a point of each stat, roughly. And that's not huge, but one thing it does do for corn, and theoretically for Kana or another corn child, um, is it lets them catch up if they ever fall behind. So especially like in Conquest, when you have all of Chapter 15 to train Corrin, you can sort of neglect him or her for a couple chapters beforehand or just not give them very many kills, and they'll still be able to catch up just fine. So it's, it's useful in that respect, but it doesn't really... like This isn't veteran from Awakening. The reason the Avatar is good is not really because they get a lot more experience than everyone else. Yep. Oh yeah, the like nobility is one of the few reasons I feel safe doing just put corn in Silas's backpack and just steamroll through the early game strats because I know that corn's going to be able to catch up. Uh, yeah, I think we're on agreement that this is uh, firmly in the nice to have category. Um, I think I'm gonna. I, I think I will be a uh, a proponent for putting it somewhere in the higher echelons of it, but we're gonna have to figure out how this uh, whole thing plays out until then. Next up is Dragon Fang. Dragon Fang is a 0.75% uh, skill chance activation skill. Hold up. <laughs> uh, Dragon Fang. Just making sure. It does, uh, you do half of your attack as extra damage. So that's going to be, a, a, depending on what, what you're attacking with. Um, it's it's kind of in a weird spot for me because it's not a skill percent uh, a skill. Because, for example, you can easily stack to 30%, like 30 skill towards like mid to late game. Uh, if you're in like a good class for it, or you just have a like a good, or you just are using Corrin or something, um, this is available to. This is also a Nor Prince or Nor Princess class, by the way. Um, Nor Prince, Nor Princess skill. I, I just, I think that there's there's definitely some places to use it, and it can definitely make some stuff a bit easier if you use if you're like dragon tanking. If you're using Dragonstone and just tanking for the early game, uh, it can it, it it can it can just be very very nice to help you kill enemies because uh, sometimes you'll just proc and you'll be like, oh great, that's another enemy I don't have to worry about. Uh, now it, that can also work against you. It can it's like uh, Fe4 Quan. Sometimes he just procs Adept and you hate your life. But uh, oftentimes I just find that it's a nice thing to have. Again, it's it's in the same boat as Nobility where you often can't justify uh, taking uh, you can't justify unequipping it. But unlike nobility, the part that I don't like about Dragon Fang is that uh, it, it's a level 10 skill. And you are going to find, at least in Conquest, that you are often going to want to at least uh, want to or just going to uh, reclass Corrin, uh, but like around that time. You might, you might be able to justify waiting until after, but every single, uh, every single moment of time that you uh, wait to reclass is one like another point of time where you haven't spent time 
uh, working on your weapon ranks. If I reclass the Wyvern a bit earlier before I get Dragon Fang, the Dragon Fang is probably not going to affect my run, but the extra weapon rank might, might make it so that I get access to Dual Club earlier. And Dual Club can be pretty uh, useful and also important for the rest of the game. Um, so, personally for me, I would put it into the niche tier. Like, it's... it's uh, it, it, don't get me wrong, it has, it, I've had calculations for endgame made so much easier by um, having access to Dragon Fang, but uh, I, I, don't think it's, I don't think it's anything better than Niche. Yeah, I think I'm in the same boat there. I, I agree with Niche, maybe for different reasons. Um, to your point about like, not necessarily getting it if you class change early, I find that usually Korn can get to, chapter, to get to level 10 by the end of chapter 7, which is before you can really... Like if you need to use axes, like a bronze axe or bronze daggers or something, you don't have those uh, in time for uh, for chapter seven. Usually, um, you can, but I don't really recommend doing that. So usually that's not a concern. But what I find is um, Dragon Fang's proc rate is really low, so it's really unreliable. And to get the kills that you want to get in the early game, you can usually get to those thresholds with concrete stats, just having enough attack to do it. So the only thing that Dragon Fang really does for you for most of the game is make you accidentally suffer from success. Um, to make you, make you take too many attacks. Uh, so the one major thing it does do for you is make it so that you can get some uh, rather scuffed end game clears. Uh, like if your corn's really kind of weak and you don't have any other backup options, um, but if you know what you need for endgame in advance, there's a lot more consistent stuff you can do to prepare for that that doesn't rely on procs. And it's really helpful if you can do that because then you don't have to replay chapter 27 if you fail. Hey, 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 what is this scuffed stuff, all right? It's a 50... Uh, I I've calculated it, and it, it only takes a capped strength Corin in a great night with a proper movement, two boots, and then... Um, trample on top of that from going into Malignite, act, uh, and making sure that you actually hit your level ups, and then also having a 50% chance to activate Dragon Fang. That's not scuffed at all. We love proc skills, right, guys? Yes, we certainly do. <laughs> Anyways, moving on to Luck plus four. This is the most. This is the most do nothing skill I've ever seen. First of all. Th these four are Azura's skills, and I would, I'm just gonna straight up say, like, if these three skills were taken off the list, I would, I would not care, and I would not notice. Um, because Inspiring Song is the only real skill that you're gonna want to get on Azura. Um, this one is straight up dog shit. Uh, Voice of Peace is, uh, occasionally useful. Luck plus four is luck plus four. And though luck is, like, slightly better in, con uh, uh, in Fates than it would be in other games, it's still um, plus four to a stat that gives you a void on a dancer that you definitely already aren't going to want to put into combat. I'm just going to put it, I'm just going to be straight up, I'm putting it into bad. Well, see, there's the niche case of passing it down to children. Like, you can do Azura Midori and get free four luck and do some nonsense with that. Um, it is pretty funny. Uh, I, think, I think just because you can pass it down, and besides, what the hell else are you going to pass down? Voice of Peace? I guess I guess I guess voice of peace on a, a kid would just be a minus two damage taken for them. But uh, I, I, you know what? I still think I think I think uh, I think it's just bad. I think it's just bad. Um, I think I disagree slightly. Uh, well, I don't know. Luck plus four by itself is is fairly decent bonus. Actually, it's a little bit extra hit, a little extra crit avoid. It makes sure that. Azura is probably not going to face crit for most of the game. Um, given she's still going to be carrying a, like a brass naginata for most of the, the playthrough, probably unless you go out of your way to train her lance rank for some reason. Um, so she's just mostly covered on that. Um, I think this skill is brought down more by context than anything, which is just that you don't really want to have Azura see combat anyway. So it doesn't do a lot for her, and. It's not the best skill of Azura's to pass down either. Um, this is like luck plus four, and this is relates to the tonics as well. Uh, luck plus four is sort of better than skill plus two because skill plus two gives you a little bit more hit by uh, one point, but luck luck plus four gives you two hit and two crit avoid, which is a little bit better than three hit. I think. I believe it also gives you a little bit of a void. That's that should be true. Yeah. 
Um, I wouldn't... Hmm. I, I'm torn between calling it... If, if it's niche, it's very niche. It, it does a couple things just to make sure, like, to guard you against certain screw-ups with Azura. Uh, yeah. Um, also, <laughs> funny you th funny thing you said about the press Naginata. I usually actually find uh, find myself ending up selling it, but I still don't like. I even after I sell it, I don't see Azura facing crit. I, it's either she dies, or she just it, either she dies or she doesn't. Like she just doesn't take enough damage to die somehow. Um, if you really want to put it into niche, then I'm fine with it. But <laughs> let it be known that I I don't I don't care about it. Yeah, I, I could go either way on that, so I'll leave it up to you. I, I, I could see any of the bottom three tiers, honestly. I could I could see calling it nice to have, but it's not super important for anything. Um, yeah, that's okay. fine. I guess. Uh, yeah, you know what? I'll, I'll put it I'll put it at the very bottom of niche. I need to remind myself to move that to the very bottom. Now, next up is the polar opposite. We have inspiring song. Ooh, baby. You know what? I'm gonna let Zoran go first on this one because I got a lot to say. <laughs> uh, inspiring song. Mm, I'm not sure whether I want to put it in meta-defining or always worthwhile. Uh, it's awesome. Uh, like plus three speed, leaving aside the other bonuses, is just fantastic. Um, when you get to the middle game of conquest, there's a couple chapters where the speed thresholds are kind of demanding. Uh, where they haven't been really before then and inspiring song can help you hit them even without having things like rally speed uh, like you can combine inspiring song and Lazlo's uh, fancy footwork and tonics and para and maybe a meal to get to a lot of the really high speed thresholds that you'd otherwise need to go like train us train a falcon knight for um, so it it covers a lot of your needs there and it's just a great bonus all around. Uh, so, um, I'm tempted to say always worthwhile, though, as opposed to meta defining. Yeah. Uh, okay. Because there there are workarounds for most of the thresholds you need to hit with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For me personally, inspiring song. It just it's it's basically it, it is kind of dumb if you do like spend it like. 20 minutes in chapter 5 grinding up Azura's level to get her to level 10 but like it saves it basically the way I see it is it saves me the hassle of having to buy tonics after I like having to reset a chapter buy tonics after I realize that I messed up uh, about some kind of speed threshold that I didn't notice or just um, saving money on tonics for some very like if there's two enemies in the map that I need to hit a certain speed threshold for I don't have to buy I don't have to spend 200 gold and worry about the inventory management stuff like that. Uh, I can just, or you know, worry about forgetting about it. It's just, it's just a skill that, it's just a skill that can often come in clutch. It gives you skill plus three, luck plus, uh, luck plus three, and speed plus three. Um, the skill and luck combine together to give you a decent chunk of hit. Uh, but obviously, the speed is the main uh, go-to there. Um, like it's 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 so universal. Like you need Leo to tank seventeen enemies. All right, here you go, inspiring song. Now he one rounds them as well. You want Xander to tank seventeen enemies? Conquest is there's a lot of tanks in Conquest. Uh, the it, it makes your life a lot easier. Um, you want you, you know you want to make it so that uh, you want to make it so that Shura can double uh, Master Ninjas in Chapter Seventeen without having to reclass him into a Master Ninja himself to get more speed. Then yeah, inspiring song can probably get you there. Um, it doesn't hurt that it's also related to something that you're always going to be doing no matter what. You're going to be dancing with Azura unless, uh, outside of some like very specific Damn, I circumstances. Believe I believe it's called singing. Uh, you know what? Well, she does a little dance when she sings too, so as far as I'm concerned, it's the same thing. Uh, but yeah, no, when you sing with Azura, it's it, you're going to be doing it every turn, or at least you're going to be trying to, doing, uh, trying to be doing it, and... Um, it's it's just always there, and I, I do agree that it's not meta defining because there absolutely are ways to work around it. A tonic and a meal can get you. Also, another thing that it does is it makes me not have to worry about the pain in the ass that is going to my going to my uh, cook uh, going to my mess hall, picking the right ingredients, making sure that it hits the right people, maybe occasionally even getting the right secondary effects. I don't have to worry about any of that with inspiring song. If I need it for speed, I can just give the get the speed off of that. But there are workarounds to it, and as a result, I don't think it's. I, I don't. I just don't think it's like 
I'm think I'm looking at these skills, and there's 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 some absolute monsters of skills that are going to be in the meta defining tier, and I just don't think that it matches up to them. So I do agree with putting it in always worthwhile. All right. Um, all right. Um, this is Voice of Peace, and Voice of Peace is you know what I'm gonna I'm gonna read out what it does just so you guys can feel how truly underwhelming it is. It's a level twenty five skill. So you're gonna be getting this around uh, chapter uh, chapter like chapter fifty uh, like chapter seventeen to chapter twenty somewhere around there. Um, enemies within two spaces inflict minus two damage with their physical attacks. So what this is saying is that it's this is defense plus two, but it's a bit fancy about it. And um, the like the thing that really just makes it garbage is that if like my honestly I don't even see my Azura often being level 25 because like there's so many maps that I just finish quickly because otherwise it's going to be really annoying to bother with or like there's a time limit on them in the mid game um the, that the 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 what you get out of this is basically one of your kids gets defense plus 2 and one of your kids getting uh, one of Azura's kids getting defense plus 2 isn't exactly terrible in fact it's actually pretty solid However, the fact that you get it at level 25 on a dancer that gets like 10 to 15 XP every time she dances um, on maps where it takes like on maps where you are highly encouraged by the game to go like 15, uh, 15 turns or somewhere around there. I just find it just not just just no, just no, really. And at that point, why would I bother with that when I could just do the brain dead pass down luck plus four and just be fine with it? I Azura is going to die regardless of whether she has defense plus two or not, unless you do some general Azura strats. I'm looking at you, Mechas Keep. You guys keep talking about general general Azura, and it pisses me off every single time. Um, yeah, no, sorry, I'm I I, I had to get that off my <laughs> chest because because I, I hear it so often, and it just makes me like it just makes me so impotently angry. But no, I would put it in bad. Like I just don't think it's like luck plus four has some redeeming qualities. I just don't think Voice of Peace has any redeeming qualities. Hmm. I disagree with you on this one. Because uh, Voice of Peace is an aura, uh, which can be pretty useful if you're if you've got if you're positioning well. Um, it's a little bit worse than something like Demoiselle Gentium, because well for one it doesn't affect resistance, but also the 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 range of the aura is a little bit more awkward because it's it reduces the attack power of enemies within two spaces, as opposed to increasing the defenses of allies within two spaces which is usually easier to work with um but you can stack auras like you can you can get voice of peace and say uh jean tm and inspiration on a single unit sometimes depending on who azura is marrying and that can be pretty powerful so i would put it either towards the top of niche or towards the bottom of nice to have myself I hate that I can see his argument. All right, fine. I'm putting it in top of niche. Uh, fine. You're right. You're right. I, I, I hate that you're right. This is... I'm, I'm not even going to spend any time talking about the skill. It's bad. Like, yes. Foreign Princess is bad. It's, it's PvP... Ba it gives you stats in PvP battles. That's all you need to know. All right, moving on to Duelist's Blow. Uh, Duelist's Blow is 40... Oh, wait, it's 40 or 30? Hold up. Phase 30, two. I believe. I'm uh, phase. Duelist Blow is 30 Avoid on Initiation. It is a level 1 Samurai skill. These are the, uh, from here to uh, even-handed over here, it's all, oh, well, I guess Beast Bane too. It's all Hoshiden skills. So uh, we're starting off with Duelist Blow. 30 Avoid when Initiation, on Initiation. Um, I think it has its uses. Like, it's not, like, you can see, you can see, like, the gears turn in and, like, the stars line in, and you can see that there are situations where I would like to have extra Avoid on Initiation. Um... Like, yeah, I don't know, you're fighting Ryoma in chapter 12 and you really don't want to get hit and you've already, like, if you're, if you're with, you're have, you have Kaze reclassed into a samurai for God knows what reason, uh, and you want him to get a bit more value out of it, and you know what, I can see it. Uh, you want to have, uh, you want to be attacking the Kitsune on chapter 19, but you don't want it to blow up in your face, even though they double you, so you have Duelist Blow. You you, uh, you you know you want to like hell even against Takumi I could see it if you if you have some like kind of shaky hit rates against you though by then the the issue with Takumi really shouldn't be the fact uh, shouldn't be how much damage he's dealing it's just how bulky he is but uh, that's that's beside the point I, I I think there are uses for it and depending on the map that you're on it's just I go into combat against threatening enemy but th this threatening enemy is less threatening than they would be otherwise and I. 
I think that I think the way that Fates works, uh, the way that you can stack a void very, very, very easily. Like you can stack a void up to 20, 20 to thirty, like effortlessly. And this can just add, but bring it up to the threshold where it actually means something valuable. Um, that being said, is it is is it that it like is is like once every like once every map at most. You get to see a, you see a really threatening enemy, and you're like, that enemy's got to go. But I need to be safe about it. So you have duelist blow. Is that really worth putting it in? Always worthwhile. I think I, I think I'm putting it in the bottom of nice to half, if that. Yeah, I'd probably rank duelist blow a little bit lower. Um, and the reason is the main thing that duelist blow does for you is it lets you save some HP potentially. You get a chance to avoid a counterattack, so you end up with more HP after the battle, which might mean that you can do another attack if Azura sings to you, or you can tank a few extra enemies on enemy phase, potentially. Um, but the problem is, since it's player phase only, this can only come up once. It can only give you that benefit one, once in the sequence. And if it only, if it only comes in once, then there's only so many opportunities like you're you're rolling the dice one time and seeing whether you win or not and you can't re although you can stack a void you can't really stack so much that you're going to consistently get like zero percent hit rates so if you if it's essential that you save this hp that you dodge this attack then you still have to some have some kind of backup whether it's a healer waiting to patch you up or another unit who can come in and block the enemies or something like that so it's not something that generally helps you plan out a turn better. It's just something that gives you extra HP sometimes. And that might translate into you know, more efficiency in later turns. Like It can compound on itself if you just constantly avoid counterattacks in that way. But also because it's player phase only, there are other ways to not take damage. Um, you can, for instance, attack from outside the enemy's range so that they'll never damage you. Or... If you stack enough damage and you like use dual strikes and damage boosting auras and everything, in a lot of cases you can just kill the enemy without ever taking a counterattack in the first place. So, duelist blow is sort of one of many ways to mitigate the damage you take on player phase, and it's not even really the most effective version of that. So, I would call it middling niche. Like it's it can help you sometimes. Um, you can do a, a full avoid stacking build if you really want to, but they're not that effective. <laughs> Subaki avoid strats. Got to do the Ferdinand things, except with Subaki. Well, uh, you know what? Now that you put it that way, you're right. But also, uh, when you said when you were talking about the zero percent hit, that that just that just showed me how different of a player we are. Because for me, if it's anything below twenty percent, I'm going for it, and nothing can stop me. If I have to reset, then I have to reset. But um, yeah, I wouldn't do that if it was lethal. Uh, I'm happy to take those low hits and see what happens. Um, like if I have a good chance to avoid, but like I said, I'll have some kind of backup option so that I can fix it if something goes wrong. Okay, now we come to vantage. Now this this is going to be kind of divisive for for us. I'm th I think because it really comes down to what you value as a player. For me, I I don't really care much about Vantage. Like I think it's I think it's funny. Like you can do some cool stuff with it. Like Super Ophelia is pretty funny to watch. But like the the way I, the, the like the use case, you can re like uh, what you get out of doing stuff with Vantage can be replicated with just other means. Like you can just instead of one hit KOing enemies, you can just like kill them and not take a bunch of damage in return and be fine. Um I don't think it's a bad skill and in fact I think it's a very useful skill for increasing reliability on units that are tanks. For example, if you have Xander and he has soul, you've given him soul because of I don't know, Charlotte or something, uh and he's just you know he's doing the he's doing what he does best and being Xander. But you know, so you're you sometimes he gets a little bit low. Um, having vantage might mean that he just kills an enemy or gets a soul off before he gets hit. Uh, that applies to a lot of other like people that use soul or like some other kind of healing uh, effect. Uh, I don't think it's bad. I just don't think it's game changing. I, I would definitely say I, for me, I would put it in nice to have. 
Like I know there's so much, so much more that you can do with Vantage, and I'm making making out of it. But I just like I just I'm a basic player. Like yeah, it, I ten times out of ten, I would much rather just have Leo, um, like uh, two round enemies, than have super, uh, than have Ophelia one hit KO them because it's less preparation on my end and less chances for me to mess it up as a player. Um, you can go ahead. Yeah, I don't think we disagree on this as much as you expect. Um, like Vantage can be incredible with, if you really know what you're doing, or like if you're putting together some, you're putting Vantage together with several other really insane skills. Um, but by itself, it's just powerful, but never really essential. Um, so I, I would, I think I would call it probably top of nice to have. There are use cases for it besides just like one shot builds or like making NOS tanking really strong. Um, and I think they're overlooked a little bit. Like, um, there, there's a decent number of scenarios where you can have uh, one like tanky unit who ends up weakening a bunch of enemies, and then you can have them or someone else with vantage kill all of them on the following turn without really worrying about like, how many attacks they're facing. Um, Ooh. So you can like weaken a group of enemies and then have your tank who did that keep moving forward and have your vantage person come back come in after be, them and clean up. I would be careful about what you say because every single word you say just keeps putting more ideas of doing vantage parry strats in my head, so Uh oh. Be careful what you wish for. I, I, <laughs> I you know what? I can see that. Nice to have. Um next we come to aptitude, a skill that I I don't know, man. Like I, the thing with aptitude is I can't quantify how much it's affected my runs, right? Like, I know that it's affected my runs because if it didn't affect my runs, it's statistically, like, unbelievably unlikely for it to not have affected my runs, for me to just have rolled the same exact levels before and after aptitude. But, um, like, it's, it's, you don't know what your run is going to look like with or without aptitude because what you have right now is your run. So I don't know what my level, level 10 Mozu is going to look like if she didn't have aptitude. Um, as it stands, though, I think aptitude. I think aptitude is a. It's a. I don't know. Like I think it's. I think the use case itself is niche, but that doesn't mean that, like I want to put it in the niche tier. But I actually think that it's like going to be better than some of some of the skills up here because, like it there there is only a specific thing that uh, specific few things that you're going to be using aptitude for, and that is making your Mozu level ups better or making your child unit level ups better more reliable. Like a Mozu Sophie is going to always have more offenses than like an Effie Sophie, um, because if you pass on aptitude. But I mean, like the thing that I mean, I don't know. Like it's 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 for child units and it's for Mozu. Like we all know that, and I'm fine with it being that way. But I don't think that it's. I don't think that it's game breaking. I don't think it's game defining. I don't even think that it's noticeable. But I might just be wrong. And um, show aptitude has been shadow carrying my runs since day one. So, uh, how do you feel about aptitude, Zoran? Um, well, one thing I think it really it, it only makes a huge difference on Mozu, and I wouldn't even say a huge difference necessarily. Um, for kids, it doesn't apply to auto levels, so. Unless you're getting a particularly early child, um, the benefit you get out of aptitude is not going to be enormous. Um, but for for Mozu in particular, um, I think this relates to how I value Mozu a lot more than certain other people do. Um, the value I see in aptitude is not what you sort of expect from the, this villager archetype character where the goal is to have like enormous growths and get them like huge stats in every area uh, what's valuable about aptitude for mozu in particular is it lets her promote relatively early and still reliably hit important benchmarks for the late game where like she wants to be fast enough to double things without being paired up for instance because that ah. dramatically improves her damage output i see um, and it gives her good chances to have like, high strength, for example. Uh, so what what can happen thanks to aptitude is you can promote it like 13 or 15 and still probably hit all the benchmarks you need for her to kill things for the rest of the game. Yeah, 
I, I, I actually like how that speaks to how we each use Mozu completely differently because uh, for me, what I use Mozu for is I use her as a backpack for somebody, get them access to Sniper because Sniper is good, get 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 a child aptitude, and uh, just just send her. But uh, I mean, I still think that that's more valuable than like a good like 30% of the units that I find in Conquest. But um, yeah, no, I, I can see that. I can see that. That's... It, it, Especially considering what Mozu has in her like reclass sets, like getting access to certain blow like two or three chapters earlier than you would otherwise. Oh my god, yeah. man, that kind like, of stuff will change yeah. your run. If you promote her early, you can give her like all of her level fifteen skills without too much delay, which is pretty silly. Yeah, um, she has plus um, twenty nine in her class set with bows, uh, which is pretty dumb. Yeah, um, but does that I, like? But at that point, is are we tying aptitude too much to Mozu as a unit, or or should we see it from the lens of we have to tie aptitude to Mozu as a unit because it's kind of her whole thing, and there's very few units other than her that can get it. Yeah, I I think you really do have to judge it in context with Mozu. Uh, it's not like I said; it's not that important to pass down to kids. Um, because it doesn't affect their auto levels. And Mozu's kids can reclass to Merchant or Master of Arms if they need to, and they want to go get like Aptitude and you know Profiteer or whatever if you want to, if you want to do that. Uh, and it can help them out, but it's, it's just not the same effect because by the time they're coming online, it just it doesn't change the results of their growths all that much for the rest of the game. Uh, I kind of uh, I kind of disagree a little bit, not not entirely, because th I feel like there are definitely some child units that could be made or broken by whether they have aptitude or not. For example, like I always get Ophelia's Paralog so early. Like the the second that Paralog is available to me, I go get it because those three tomes are going to change the way I play the game. And so having her having Ophelia with aptitude, even though I haven't done it since my first one. Like, it made me, made it so that I was able to justify keeping her, like, deployed for longer. And, I mean, like, the other good example is uh, Sophie. W with Sophie, you can just get her, and, like, she's gonna have, like, what? Uh, Mozu, Sophie. That's not Sophie, no. Uh, she's, she has, like, she has, like, uh, like, because Silas and Mozu both, because Mozu joins early, and there's a lot of other male characters that join early, you can easily see yourself getting these characters early. Like, uh, Mozu, Mozu Sophie has 70% 70, 70 speed and skill, and 60% strength, 50% HP, 50% defense, 40% res. Like, these are, these are not stats that you would sneeze at. And her, like, uh, her, her bases are going to be good no matter what, or going to be serviceable no matter what. She's a child unit. Mm -hmm. But, uh... Yeah, I, it, it can make a bigger difference if you rush, like, an early uh, kid. And Mozu's yeah, there but, but like yeah, if you do like a Mozu Leo or something, you're not gonna you're not gonna care because you're probably gonna get Forest late no matter what. Because <laughs> let's be realistic here, Gazak is probably gonna end up impacting your run more than an Aptitude Forest. Sure. Uh, and the later you get him, the better it is. Uh, I, yeah. I, I agree with that. Where where did you want to put it? I wanted to uh, put it in top of niche, uh, bottom of nice to have. I, I'm I'm torn about whether I think it's better than nobility or not. Um, I'm willing to say that it's better. I'm willing to say that's better. Yeah, I kind of do too. Uh, they're, they're sort of similar in the way that they can. Ultimately, I think the best thing it does for you is it helps you get like high level skills faster mm -hmm. um, because you can justify promoting earlier because you're still going to hit your staff thresholds otherwise. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that actually does more for you than nobility does usually. All right, let's put it above nobility for now. If we change our minds on it, then fair enough. All right. Now, let's move on to Underdog. Now, Underdog is a skill that's only available to villagers. Uh, and um, so, again, that's the Mozu skill. Now, the thing for me with Underdog is that it's just, it is, it is just trashed on by the fact that it's, it's a level 10 skill. And um, look, look at it this way, right? You could be getting plus 15 hit and avoid when your enemy has higher level, or you could be getting half of death blow, right? And not even like, and when I say half of death blow, I mean half of like half of uh, three houses death blow, not fate's death blow that gives crit. Like four damage on initiation is what you could be getting, and instead you're looking like a fool over here, getting some extra hit and avoid. You could be working on your bow rank, getting prepared for the big leagues with certain blow and bow fare, but you're over here with a hit and avoid. It's severely held back by the fact that merch, uh, by by the fact that villager is just kind of a shit class. I would put I would put it into nice to have, but maybe at the bottom. It's just it's just you would never like 
what, when, why would you go to Vil? Like, it, there's two things, right? If you want to get have, there's only a few people that can have it, right? It's only child units, Mozu. Those are the only people that can have it. So, and on Mozu, uh, like, why would you want it when you could just be an archer and you can, uh, and once you get to sniper, you get an innate hit bonus and you also get the certain blow for the same amount of hit. Or on your child units, you could have just done it with Mozu ahead of time and passed it down and not have to bother reclassing into villager and worry about that stuff. Um, now, to be fair, you would be passing, uh, getting away, getting rid of aptitude for that. But as we discussed on child units, it's kind of a, it's not always necessary. I would put it into top of niche, uh, maybe uh, like a top to middle. It, it's it, I would put it into niche, like the middle niche, top to middle. Um, I think there's a fundamental problem with this skill, which is that this is not a game where you are under leveled relative to your opponents as a main as a primary combat unit. So, if you're making use of a unit who has this, they're not going to be able to use it. And if you're if they're able to use it, they're not really strong enough to be worth deploying. Uh, like even if by the time Mozu gets to level ten, she'll be on, she'll be at parity with enemy levels. Actually, that's there's, just there's the way one the experience curve the, works. There's one part of the game that I actually, would actually disagree with uh, this on. It's only one part of Conquest, but I still want to put put this out there just for any players. Like if you if you like for some reason kept Mozu and Villager and you have Underdog, like there's uh, chapter nineteen, chapter twenty, and chapter twenty one are three maps that are flyer skip central. Um, you deploy flyers and anything else is going to be so much headache that I would highly not recommend it. But then after that, when you come back, you are, your units are going to be slightly underleveled. And that point of the game, like, that's why I, I put actually a lot of unit value into units that are able to make that jump pretty easily. Like, units like Kaze, Niles, uh, Perry, stuff like that. And Underdog can actually be active for a while in there and it can help you out. I'm always a fan of big uh, hit and avoid. But uh, yeah, this is not the way that I would go about getting it. So I would put it into, yeah, where would you want to put it? Uh, I would have called it bad. Um, speaking to your point about coming back after skipping 19, 20, 21, um, that's, yeah, that, it can happen that way. Um, but I, I don't re really see a situation where if you stuck with Villager on either Mozu or her kid, I don't think on a kid that's probably not going to be that they're probably going to have enough other skills to not want this. And on Mozu, if she's stuck with villager all that time, like I mentioned before, like with Mozu, you really want to promote a little bit early. So she's going to be ahead of the level, the nominal level curve, even if she's not really ahead of the experience curve. So, and this works off your display level. So if you promote it at level like 13 and you're a 13, 13.8, like, merchant or something, then you're a level 8 merchant as far as the game is concerned for this so calculation. So it would be 28, level 28. Yeah. Uh, so it, it just doesn't work out the way you want it to. This, sound, this look good to you? Uh, yeah, that's fine. Um, All right. You could argue that there's a certain situation. I mean, probably there's more use you can get out of it than luck plus 4, to be honest. Um, uh, but I would... I I, I could be swayed to call them both. Bad, I, I think these two are basically interchangeable as far as like the viability. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's move on to the the the, the pair of uh, potion skills. This is potent potion. This is quick salve. I'm gonna let Zoran talk about these first because I always talk about them first, and I want to give him some chance. Sure. Uh, so potent potion gives you fifty percent more effect from uh, tonics and healing items. Um. And so that's. HP tonics become plus seven, and luck tonics become uh, plus six, and everything else becomes plus three. Uh, I've always felt this is a little bit overrated. I, I've seen some people talk about this and like say it's like like having defender but without pair up or something. But there is a monetary cost to like, loading up on <laughs> tonics. Yeah, all across that, the board. that would be what. Uh, HP, strength, or magic, skills, speed, luck, defense, res. That's like that's like fourteen hundred a chapter. That's yeah, it's not, not exactly prohibitively expensive, but it is. You're going to notice that fun dip. Yeah, and you can that you can just get the tonics for the essentials, and it will help you. Uh, like it's nice to get three strength instead of two, and three speed instead of two. Uh, but it's the effect I think is a little bit overblown. There's 
there's lots of ways to stack stats in this game, and this one is a pretty minor one that does have an inherent monetary cost just to activate. Um, so I would call it nice to have, but probably no higher. Oh yeah, uh, I, I I agree with the final tiering, but I would I think I would disagree with it, you a little bit on there. Um, I think you're underrating the fact that Potent Potion is be able to make vulneraries and concoctions more reasonable to use. Um, otherwise, Fate's vulneraries are so cringe. It's like, oh yeah, 10 HP, 3 uses. Oh, I want to have a little bit more HP. Let's lower the number of uses. It's Fate's, it's, it's Fate's inventory uh, creation at, at its worst. But uh, you can get... Like, normally in the early game, you get to use vulneraries on, like, Odin if he's a bit under level and you, it makes him a bit more reliable. But then you get Potent Potion and you're able to use it for 15 HP and that, that's able to keep you, like, in that, like, I can make my stuff a bit more reliable for a bit longer. It's, it's very, it, it's, it can save your ass and it has saved my ass, like, at least twice. And I think that, I think that the whole Defender thing is, at, like, obviously a bunch of nonsense, but I do still think that it's a valuable effect. And you will be better off having it than like if you if, if it's going to cost you very little to grab this skill, then I would say yeah, go for it because like there's points where you really want to spend use your meal on somebody else, but you want to get some extra of a specific stat, then uh, uh, then you can get value off of this. Um, I actually think that funnily enough, I think that the most valuable like gain that you get off of uh, potent potion is the fact that luck tonics becomes uh, becomes six luck. Six luck is. Six luck is like significant. Like you are getting like three hit and three avoid or something like that, and that's 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 funnily enough, it's significant. I also agree with putting it in nice to have. I think I, I must. I'm honestly like I'm. It's either here or here for me. Like nice to have here or here. Yeah, I, I would put it below vantage because I think vantage can change your approach to the game in a way that potent potion just can't. Um, I, I agree with your point about how uh, healing items are sort of disappointingly inefficient. Um, it's not so much that they don't. I think it's not so much that they don't heal enough, but they're not very cash effective. So, like, I love using my vulnerabilities that I get for free, um, but you can end up spending a lot of money if you're relying on vulnerabilities as your main healing source. Um, it's one of the reasons why I, I like to transition towards builds in the second half of the game that are a little bit more healing independent by various means. Oh, yeah. Um, um, let's move on to quick self. I have, I don't know, man. I, I, I have no idea about quick self. Like I, like, like I, I can see what you're trying to do with it, but it just doesn't make any sense to me in my mind. I'm just, uh, I'm just going to let you talk about this because I don't know. Uh, yeah, as far as I know, it's this, uh, applies to the same items as, uh, potent potions. So the effect is basically you can move and heal yourself and then attack if you want. Um, or theoretically, you could move and tonic yourself and then attack. Uh, I don't know what situ well, I can imagine some like extremely niche situations where you'd want to tonic after moving, but it's it's very silly, uh, like tonic and then attack still. Um, you got an Azura self sitting in the convoy, and you're like, hey, I might as well use it. Yeah, I mean, what I can think of is like activating vow of friendship by having corn use an HP tonic and still being able to attack that oh turn. Oh my goodness, that is that is nasty. <laughs> Or activating Vantage the same way. Uh, but, like, when do you ever have Vantage and Quick South together? Um, and so it does help. It's one of those things that can save you actions by letting you heal yourself and attack, and that's, that's nice. Um, but it, it's just difficult to make it really work for you in practice. Uh, also, you I would probably like way probably better ways of saving actions. Yeah, I, I would, I would maybe put it towards the higher end of niche, because um, I, I can envision like things that can help you do. It's just there are m many better ways to achieve that goal most of the time. So also the class that it's in is like so hard to access. Sure. Yeah. All right. Uh, next up is Lock Touch. I'm. I, I want to put Lock Touch in Magnet Defining. I'm just being completely honest. There are so many maps with so much treasure, and all of the units that you get with Lock Touch are at least somewhat decent in Conquest. Your your Lock Touch squad is Niles, Kaze, and Shura. These are three units that you're probably going to be deploying no matter what. Um, every other map or something has chests on, on it, and all of these chests 
well, I don't want to say all of these chests, because there's, there's like the Venge Noggin out of chest, which is garbage, but most of these chests have at least something of value in them, and Loctus just makes your life uh, ten times easier, and honestly, sometimes it makes you, I mean, Loctus like, can often just let you do things that you just straight up wouldn't be able to do otherwise, like, for example, I mean, if you, the maps don't give you chest keys often, if at all. They give you they give you door keys if you need them to get through the map, but that's basically about it. You get like maybe one chest key if the game's trying to be generous on Lunatic, and uh, that's about it. Lock touch is basically um, this skill. It's basically click here if you wanna if you wanna get about forty thousand gold for the rest of the campaign, and I I'm, I'm going to click here. Um, yeah, I'm I'm not. Hmm. I'm kind of thinking I want to call it always worthwhile in the sense that. It's worth having someone who has lock touch and bringing them um, on many of the maps that have treasure. That said, uh, really none of the treasure chests are absolutely required. Um, there's, for example, there's trying to think through this. There's a couple in chapter eleven. Uh, of course, there's the rescue chest in chapter nine, but you can open that because you do get a chest key on Azura. So. If you can forego the Brass Naginata, you can still get rescue without Lock Touch, but you have Niles, and there's no reason not to bring him. Um, chapter 11 has a Spirit Dust and an Enfeeble, which can be helpful. The Enfeeble more than the Spirit Dust can be helpful against like Rioma in the next map and some and other bosses in the mid game. Chapter 12 uh, has an Armor Slayer and, and some 5,000 gold, I believe. Um, That's the only Armor Slayer you have by then, by the way, so like for, it makes your life a lot easier on Chapter 13. Yeah, it can be helpful against the Knights in 13. Uh, there's like a bunch of different places where it, it definitely helps. It's one of your main sources of money through the campaign because I, I think you get another 10,000 in chapter 14 from a chest and there are no keys on that map. Um, there's 5,000 in chapter 17 I believe in one of those chests. Oh yeah. Um, and then chapter 18 has 10,000. Chapter 19 doesn't no, it doesn't have that much money. Chapter like uh, yeah like every like every two to three chapters you get another 10k gold at least. Yeah, so it it is your main source of revenue for the campaign, and in that sense, like you, there's no reason not to bring it, and it's worth having at least one person who has it. Um, I don't. I just sort of disagree with the idea of calling it meta defining because you can't do without it, and even though like a lot of the things you miss out on are very useful, it is possible to. Uh, like reasonably get through the game without most of those things but like mm -hmm. at that point you're actually like it, like it, it is like, basically it playing way. a challenge run if you yeah, just don't playing play lock without touch. lock not using lock touch is you playing a challenge run doesn't that doesn't that warrant lock touch being put into meta defining and another like another thing that like i would agree with putting it in always worthwhile but at least in conquest the units that you get with lock touch are so hard not to use right True. Like the yeah. If we're, if we're talking lock about touch. lock touch or in, well, we're putting this through a conquest lens, it seems, and yeah, they're all of the lock touch units are pretty good. Um and yeah, like so, I, I just I just like, I think okay, I'm willing to agree to put it in always worthwhile for now, but but I feel like I want to I want to revisit this again later. I on, I, I think like, we can what? stick it meta defining. I I think. Talking through it. Yeah. it, it makes sense. Yeah. Uh, here we come to Poison Strike, an enemy that is can uh, a skill that is cancer to deal with when it's on the enemies, and a skill that is extremely well, pretty impractical when it's with you. Um, Poison Strike. I mean, it's 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 damage. It's free damage. You like it? It's chip damage, and it's on ninjas, so you can do it on one to two range, so you can figure out whether you want to, and you, so you can avoid counterattacks. It's nice, but you can yeah. just kill the enemy instead, right? Yeah, it's very firmly probably a lower end nice to have because, uh, like you said, in a lot of cases you can just kill the enemies. It's more potent in the enemy hands than it is in your hands. Um, can be useful as a training tool. It can make Kaze more useful from the get go, even if he didn't get like super buff from training in the prologue. Uh, but it's not that powerful in your hands. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, seal res. Now, seal defense is a different breed, but seal uh, seal res, I think, is in such a weird spot. It's an Oni Savage, so getting access to it, it's like, wow, I'm getting seal res, bro. I'm in a class with this much strength, this much HP, this much defense, and I'm getting seal 
resistance. Like, what what are you giving to me? I I just don't see it, man. I just don't see it lining up. It just doesn't seem like like Oni 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 Chieftain is a solid class, but I find it some solid more because of the pair up bonuses being solid and uh, having access to like having access to tomes and also axes and just having that like high of magic stat is just nice. But um, and all, some of the units that you get as Oni Chieftains are pretty solid, like Kumagera. And even like even in like birthright and rev like Rinka is pretty bad, but as an Oni chieftain, she's a pretty solid backpack. But other than that, I just don't see a use case for it. Yeah, with a couple of these sort of rarer Oshidan classes, I think it's the only way to have a useful conversation about them is to bring in some ideas from what you would do with birthright. Uh, just because like the only way you're getting to Oni is if you capture an Oni savage, and Oni savage captures are like okay, um, or if Cor it's Corn's talent. And you can do that. It's, it can be pretty fun to go with Oni Corrin um, and do some skill shenanigans there. But uh, there are just better options, so it's not something I would normally recommend. Um, I think Seal Res, Seal Res is not great, but it's a little bit better than it appears at first blush because uh, Oni Chieftain is one of the few very tanky Oshidan classes. So on Birthright, yeah, you can solo everything with Ryoma, basically. Uh, but if you want to bring in another tank, like one of your better options is actually a uh, Rinka. Hinata? Who, oh, I was um, going to say Hinata. You, you, you can do Oni Savage like Hinata or, or Hayato too. Um, but Rinka works pretty well, actually, because her defense is just so much better than most other characters. And um, enemy resistance well, yeah, is not AI doesn't care about whether it deals damage to you or not yeah, right yes yeah they'll attack you even if they can do it for zero um so Rinka is one of the one of the few like immediately viable tanks and you can send her through Oni Chieftain and she's she is much better if you do a magic build um she depending on how she's pretty fast so normally she can and like the bolt axe is insanely strong so normally she can hit one round kill thresholds um, but Seal Res can help her out sometimes, depending on the situation. Uh, I would call it like lower end of niche, probably. Okay, uh, I just I just want to bring a very small point of contention. But like Hinata is actually like flexing on Rinka in terms of bulk because he just has the same bulk, but he has way better HP. So if yeah. you want to do like a big tank, like I'm just being straight up, just pull Hinata. He's gonna have no speed, but who cares? It's birthright. Yeah, his issue is lack of one-two range options generally. Yeah. Um, so like bolt axe Rinka gen or like bolt axe slash horse spear at Rinka tends to do better just in terms of countering enemies more often. Oh yeah, yeah, you're right. Okay, uh, I'm willing to put it into like top of niche. Like if it if it, if it's if it lets you do a strategy on a full route, like it, I'm I'm basically where do you want me to put it? Because that's where I'm putting it. Uh, hmm. I would consider it better than Dragon Fang, but worse than Voice of Peace. Okay, I can see that. All right. Next up is Shove. Oh, man. Shove is... It's so dependent on how you play the game, right? Because, yeah. Because, like, you could be the guy that's just, like... You could be the guy that's just, like, moving kind of slowly. And I'm, I'm fine with you doing that. But if you're moving kind of slowly, you don't really have too much of a use for Shove. But if you're blazing through these maps at, like, 2, 3, 1, 4, 2, 1 turns, like, a map, then you are going to be able to make good use of Shove and Swap. And... Shove is also nice for just some like niche like um, like positioning stuff. Like you put somebody where you want somebody else to be, so you can shove them out of the way to create an opening or something like that. Or you know sometimes you just want a little bit more movement to reach a specific spot. Even if you're going a bit slower, you might need to reach a specific spot so that there's some enemies that don't aren't as much of a threat, so you can shove somebody. Um, like hell, even conquest. Like I I've captured Oni savages just for shove like i usually have kumagera for one shove bot but if i need a second one i'm like if i need more movement like shove is one of my favorite options to use because it's so easy to get it's it's uh it's level 10 and there's a lot of oni savages and stuff and uh oni chieftains even in later game with certain blow and heart seeker and whatnot that you can just get shove on easily and it's i just find i just find that it's a it's a solid skill um yeah i would probably put it towards the top of niche honestly um it can be used in certain uh, like LTC strategies, although I haven't verified this myself like on every single thing. Um, I'm not super interested in LTC, generally speaking. Um, 
I'm pretty sure there's enough movement tech in the game that you can overcome the you you can make up for the the shove distance in other ways. Um, I don't think you ever really need it. Like you can one turn in game without any of the real movement skills. Oh yeah, um, and also like if you like for general play, if you need a movement skill, swap is probably going to be better for you because you can also take that person's place and like you can move somebody that's frail to the back and also move somebody that's bulky to the front by using swap. Yeah, um, I think both of the movement skills. I guess we can sort of talk about swap at the same time, although we'll get to it in a second. Um, to me, it seems like they help you if you are definitely like LTCing everything, or if you're relatively inexperienced and you're like making some positioning mistakes, and then they can help you correct those. But anywhere in between, there's there's not a huge uh, market for those two skills. Um, I think I think this is where I want to put them. Like personally, that's just where I want to put them. All right, I, I wouldn't argue too fiercely against that. Um, that seems basically fair. Okay, uh, let's move on to uh, seal defense. Seal defense is kind of the opposite of seal res, where seal res is kind of like you you have to you have to you have to find out what it is you do with seal res. Whereas seal defense is exactly what it looks like on first lens. First of all, it's a pain when it's on the enemies, but unlike a lot of these skills that are kind of really annoying on enemies, like poison strike, you can actually make a decent amount of use out of seal defense. Uh, seal defense is basically like it's there's actually a lot of utility for seal defense. Seal defense is available on a lot of like strong like solid units. You can get it on Hitaka, you can get it on like you can get it on Obro, you can get it on uh you can get it on uh what's his face? Uh I already said Hitaka. I guess it's Shiro? only just, it's Oh yeah, Shiro. Well, <laughs> I I haven't actually used Shiro before, but I guess you could get it on him. You can get it on anybody that's going Spearmaster really. And uh, Spearmaster is a I mean it's a solid class. Like weapon lock classes are usually at least okay. Um and uh Spearmaster is 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 the most at least okay out of those classes um and seal defense it, not only does it let you like like debuff a bunch of enemies regardless of whether you hit them or not it also makes you your kill setups a lot easier um so this is a bit of a weird and largely inapplicable story but i once did a um full uh fates iron man where i went through birthright and conquest and rev all in iron man all dead units passed over to the next game but all skills also passed over so basically the entirety of birthright was how many different classes can i get corn into and um i didn't do it with seal defense but i did it with draconic hex and for the entirety of like the first 10 to 15 maps of conquest corn uh, was the world's like godliest kill setup engine and it wasn't even because like of, of most of the debuffs except for the ones that made it so that you did more damage debuffing for your allies is very good for setting up kills and i just think that that elevates this to at least nice to have honestly i would put it maybe even always worthwhile uh, i would stick with nice to have and personally probably on the lower end of that um i think for g general purposes you are going to get more mileage out of this than like seal resistance they're just more and more teammates who benefit from having an opponent's defense sealed um it's in in conquest it's it's sort of difficult to get this on a unit who matters uh because Hitaka exists but uh he's really held back by being a footlock for the whole game uh i would say he's held back more by the fact that he doesn't have any access to reclasses more than the fact that he's a footlock true i think yeah. his stats more than make up for it yeah, I mean, his, his problem isn't, like, being bad at one-on-one -on -one combat or anything. It's just he doesn't get to go places. Mm -hmm. um, and he doesn't get to do anything particularly special with what he has. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm a little bit torn on this, because for the way I play, uh, I have a pretty good idea of, like, what stat thresholds I need to hit, and I'm not usually in a situation where I need to, like, if I do need to seal a boss's defense, usually I have Enfeeble for that or or something, so I don't necessarily need to bring this skill. Um, it, it can be useful depending on your approach, though. So I would I would tend to put it towards the lower end of nice to have. All right. Um, I think I, I want to put it over Poison Strike at least. 
Uh, yeah. The nice thing about seal defense is it works on enemy phase too. So even if you can't counter, you can still. And also, you get it enemies. so early on, right? Because, yeah. Because like uh, setting up kills is going to be e uh, more important uh, and easier to do early on. So it yeah. just makes it more. It, it does make spear fighters better at enemy phase than they would otherwise be by a lot. Because even if they're not like taking a javelin and countering, which is actually a problem for them on birthright, because there's only there's only one javelin. Um, oh right. Uh, even if they're not countering, they're still contributing to whatever your units are going to do on the next turn. So that's that's pretty useful. Okay. All right, now we come to Magic Plus 2. I'm just going to go out on a limb here. I'm just going to... I, I, I vote for a motion that all of the Stat Plus 2 skills just be put into Always Worthwhile and we don't have to worry. Except for the ones that give you more than more than plus 2 to a... More than or less than plus 2 to a stat, like Movement Plus 1 or HP Plus 5. Or, like, we can discuss those separately. Because, uh, like... Yeah, I would say skill plus two, maybe you would have a different conclusion on, but... Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Skill yeah. plus two also is, like, a kind of meh. Uh, yeah, I think that's a fair placement. Um, okay. They're I'm, I'm, very solid skills. Um, I would maybe... We can, we can, yeah, we can I think we should, we should discuss them a little bit more in detail individually. For magic plus okay. two, it fits into the general theme of, like, stacking damage-boosting skills on people. Um it's not the most powerful thing in the world, um, but it's it's a skill that you get immediately as a level one diviner. So it, it comes online very, very quickly, whether you're starting in diviner or you're class changing to it. And uh, it helps you out in pretty much every scenario. Mm -hmm. unless, unless you have a skill that's strictly better than magic plus two, you're going, and you're if you're in a magic class, Unless you have skill that's strictly better than Magic Plus 2, like, if you have a skill that's, like, if you have Tome Fair, then you're going to want to have Magic Plus 2, right? Like, it's, there's, there's just no reason to unequip it. And by the time you have a reason to unequip it, you've probably already gotten so much mileage out of it that you've, you've, you're happy with what it's done. Yeah. Oh, God, Future Sight. I just want to put Future Sight in bad. I'm just being honest here. Like, it's, it's so, it's, it's niche beyond niche to the point where I just... Uh, like I I I I resent it almost because because of it existing. It almost wants me to. It almost promotes a play style that makes me like it. It makes me mad to just conceptualize it. But that might just be me speaking. Um, I don't know if you have any strong opinions on Future Sight, but uh, if you do, this would be the yeah. time and place to talk about them. Uh, to be clear on this. Um... This is off the top of my head, but I believe it's double experience gain, luck percent chance, player phase only. Um, so it, I'm, I'm pretty certain it can only activate when you kill things on player phase. It has to be on kill yes. as well. Yeah. Um, if it was 100 EXP, then we would be on to something, but it's only double the EXP. So if, you get, so if you're already super over leveled, then... Yeah, so it's, it's kind of like nobility in that... It can't really help you stay far ahead or get you far ahead of the curve. And it's a lot less consistent about getting you uh, caught up if you're behind. Like, it's a low activation chance. It only applies on your phase. It's basically never worth thinking about. Uh, it, it might come up, but it's not going to change your game at all. Yeah, another thing to point out is that it's luck percent and, like... Orochi sure as hell isn't getting that, uh, getting a good luck stat because her luck is very, like, her luck isn't bad, but it's like, it, but it's definitely not good. Um, Hayato is probably doing that, but if you're using Hayato, you're probably doing some wild stuff with him, and I, I respect it. But also that if you're doing some wild stuff with him, then you're probably not going to be caring, uh, caring too much about um, having like putting him in a class that has good luck, unless you're doing Basara, I guess. But uh, yeah, no, I just find that it's it's just not going to have a use case in your run. Yeah. Um... Speaking of Hayato, I, I think Future Sight could be slightly more interesting if it were the level one skill and you were using Birthright. Hayato starts at level one, and then you like you try to rig it so you get double experience and you like get a whole level immediately or something. But it doesn't work that way. He has to get to level ten first. So it, by then he's basically caught up. Yeah, it's it's just it's just fate's design. Like uh, Diviner has the highest of the highs. And the lowest of the lows. Um, let's see. Uh, miracle. I mean, I don't think we need to give a dissertation on why Miracle is bad. Yeah, I think we all know this. Uh, you shouldn't ever put yourself in a situation where Miracle is going to help you. 
the only reason, well, outside of like doing like luck stack Midori stuff, if you if you're doing that, then power more power to you. But outside of that, you're never gonna. Uh, it it doesn't even work against an opponent in PvP who knows what they're doing. So, yeah, it's pretty useless. Yeah. Now, Rally Luck, on the other hand, now this is what this is what this is like. This is what happens when you take Rally Skill to the gym. Uh, it, it takes a bunch of steroids and it comes back. This is this is this is one hell of a rally skill. It gives you. Uh, let me let me pull up the calculations here really quickly. Um, rally rally luck will give you. All right, uh, it is going to give you. Uh, it's going to give you four hit. It's going to give you four avoid. It's going to give you four. Uh, and it's going to give you four crit avoid, for all allies within two range. Four hit, four avoid, four crit avoid. And Rally Luck is in a class line that also gets access, easy access to Rally Magic. So I mean, the way I'm see the way I see it is that Rally Luck is like in in Conquest. Admittedly, it's pretty hard to access outside of Izana, but like it's if you have it, you're going to use it, and it's always like it's always worth having because like you get some pretty solid luck boosting stuff, but it always stacks on top of each other. So you can ha you can have Luck Plus Four and a Luck Tonic. And rally luck on top of each other. It's not like it's not like stuff uh, like Perry's personal where it doesn't stack with rally uh, rally strength or rally speed. You you will have the ability to put more on top. I just think it's a good. I just think it's a, fun, a completely solid skill. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like the plus four hit, and I actually really like the plus four dodge. Um, especially well. Later, later in the campaign, you see a lot of enemies that, have, that are in classes with innate crit. Um, and those bonuses are halved for enemies. So like Spearfight, uh, let me see here. So like enemy berserkers would have 20 extra crit, but the behind the scenes, it cuts it to 10 for enemies. But still, you see like several enemy classes that have innate crit. And that tends to give them like 2, 3, 4, 5% listed crit on a lot of units. Um, because they're just, there aren't that many sources of crit avoid in this game. And the biggest one that you can really attach to a character, as opposed to just getting through leveling up and getting luck, is using bronze weapons. Um, forged bronze weapons are amazing, but there are certain niches that they just can't cover. Like, if you need to use a brave, or you have to use one of the dual weapons, or, uh, or anything like that. Like, if you're a ninja and you want to use. If you want to do a soul yeah, ninja build or something, yeah, soul have, ninja. Yeah, I was gonna say that. Uh, you can't get also that. another way. Another way of getting creative void is just like being privileged, like Xander, and just having crit void on your weapon. Yes. So like the the main source for a lot of characters is getting crit void on their weapons. And for most characters, that means either a bronze weapon or a joke weapon, um, or personal. Yeah. Um, you can also get it by pairing up. That gives you five crit void automatically, and there are a couple other things. Um, but rally luck can prevent a lot of resets from low percent crits late in the game. And it's more accessible in Conquest than you might think, because there are capturable Shrine Maidens in Chapter 9 and Chapter 11. Um, and the Chapter 11 one is like already level 10 or 11. So you can just pick that one up and get them a few levels from healing. Oh yeah, and the one in Chapter 11 also already knows Miracle, which is good. I think, well, no, 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 uh, that room actually doesn't have any Shrine Maidens in it, I'm sorry. Yeah, I don't believe that Shrine Maiden has Miracle. Because I yeah, feel like if it the, did, the I'd be Azama worried about room. capturing it a lot more. The Azama yeah. Room is the one. Yeah, Azama miracle. Room spams Miracle. Um, so, I'm yeah, gonna put, I want to put it in bottom of Always Worthwhile, personally, that's all. Yeah, I think that seems reasonable. Uh, oh, Darting Blow. Darting Blow, Darting Blow, Darting Blow. I, I, I want to sing the praises of this for like an hour, but uh, I, I, you know what? I, I, this is this is my again self reflection. I realize that I've gone first on these things too many times, so I'm gonna let like Zoran go first this time. Uh, well, I think I'm a little bit less enthusiastic about this. Um, it is a nice skill. Uh, it can certainly help people hit kill thresholds, and I I'm actually a big believer in player phase offense, in especially in conquest, um, and it can help you out a lot. Uh, it's just. It's not that common that by the time you get, if you're getting someone who learns Darting Blow, it's not that common that they need it. I know there are some captures that have it, and that can help them out. Um, 
but for a character who actually sending through Sky Knight, um, it's not that likely to make <laughs> a big difference. Uh, for Subaki, it is pretty essential, though. That's the main main way he gets to double things. Um, so yeah, in in Birthright, for particularly Subaki, it can be a nice skill to have. Um, I so like putting putting it in those terms. I would be tempted to put it towards the high end of nice to have instead of always worthwhile. Um, okay, so the like the way I see it is, uh, Darting Blow takes you from like there's there's different speed tiers, right? There's you get doubled. You don't double. You don't get doubled, but you don't double. There's you double. Darting blow takes you up a full speed tier. Um, that can mean that Subaki, instead of not doubling, he doubles. And the, in in a world where Subaki joins extreme with garbage stats in birthright and rev, you can that can keep him in the running for long enough for him to get laid and get you a dot, uh, get you a solid kill dory that can get you uh, that can do his work for him. And this kill dory is also going to have darting blow. And what her darting blow is going to mean is that she's going to go, she's going to go from already doubling to will never not double uh, category. Um, darting blow is also like. Uh, like it, it, you can also find it on uh, like some generics, for example. There's some. Uh, there's obviously there's Darting Blow Sky Knights, uh, but you know it's on Kumagera, for example. Uh, Kumagera can actually yeah. double some uh, like mid tier enemies with it. Kumagera but you're also has, definitely Kumagera has Darting Blow and Certain Blow, right? Darting Blow, Certain Blow, and Counter. Yeah, and he can get Death Blow if you want for whatever. Yes, yeah, so he can worth. get Death Blow and oh no, sorry, he has Counter Magic. He can get Death yeah. Blow and Counter. So. Yeah, they they have the they have the kit built for him in his uh, in his base class, uh, but no, yeah, I just think that darting blow is just a like this is this is not even conquest centric. This is a rev centric perspective. I just think that darting blow is a good skill to have. It's just gonna make your life a lot easier, especially in a game where you have such easy access to like marriage to flyers, right? Because you have uh, or this being a flyer, right? Because you have. Uh, you, you can, like, for some characters, you can uh, marry Selena. Well, for I say some characters, it's just Laszlo. Laszlo can marry Selena to get access to Sky Knight. Selena can get, get access to Sky Knight. There's Kale Dory, there's Subaki, there's Reyna, there's Korn if you do Korn stuff. Uh, there's Sakura, there's uh, there's Ryoma, there's uh, Takami. Uh, all these people have uh, Sky, Sky Knight in their base class. Like, you can do a lot of, you can get it uh, in for a lot of people. And admittedly, it's going to have varying degrees of usability, but at the minimum bound, it's going to be giving you speed. And we all know speed is good, so I think I think it's at least always worthwhile. Like you are never going to like be like, oh man, darting blow. Pfft, who wants that? Like, who's when are you saying that? Right? Yeah, I, I just think it's worth the all. Yeah, I would about. never turn it down. I mean, I should say, unless I have several other amazing skills to go on top of it. Yeah. If you're um, picking, if you're picking like a fair skill over uh, over a darting blow, if you're picking like a dagger fair over darting blow, then you know what? Fair enough. You probably got better things to be doing than worrying about attack speed on player phase. Um, uh, next up, this is camaraderie. This is ten percent HP when in range of allies. Um, this is an extremely passive healing ability, which is nice, but also it's it's ten percent. Like, what are you gonna get off of ten percent? It can even, like, I mean, you're obviously not going to equip camaraderie and vantage on the same set, but, like, you know, if you're if you're dumb like me, you can get knocked out of certain thresholds for uh, HP based on that. Hell, I mean, you can get knocked out of stuff like Vow of Friendship with camaraderie if you're going Sky Knight Corrin, uh, stuff like that. Uh, I just think that, like, it, the, the it's not, it, it's, in all likelihood, these cases are fringe. It's not going to actively hurt you in all likelihood, but it's not going to actively help you either. Uh, like Amaterasu, I would much rather have Amaterasu or um, uh, Azura's personal than uh, this because um, you're you're not even guaranteed that your Sky Knight's going to be uh, close to allies at start of turn, right? So yeah, um, yeah, I think I sort of do appreciate these passive, like low percent healing skills, maybe a little bit more than other people do. Um, like definitely, I wouldn't. Wouldn't want to have camaraderie on Corn in the early game most of the time because of what you mentioned with power friendship, um, but it it can be not, like most of the time it's it's condition is very easy to trigger and it's like okay free two to three HP per turn uh, for most of the game and that's nice. Um, it's not important really, uh, but it it's one of those things that just consistently makes your like your action economy a little bit better. Um, bottom of nice to have. 
Yeah, I could see that. Um, I mean, like, we literally described it as something that's nice to have, but not overly impactful, right? Yeah. So, it, it doesn't think it's nice to have. Yeah. And there's this sort of weird tension between, like, the bottom of nice to have and the high end of niche, where, like, you could say, well, there are some certain niche things, like Voice of Peace, I think. Probably I get more mileage out of it in a conquest run than camaraderie for sure, um, because of the combination of availability and being able to stack with certain other powerful things. Uh, but if you're trying to keep this discussion as general as possible, yeah, I, camaraderie probably does more for you for more of the game than Voice of Peace does. Um, oh, one thing, one thing I want to mention with that is. Uh, it's not that uncommon to have like, like one thing you can think about is if you have like 25 HP, you can take an HP tonic just to make camaraderie heal you for three HP instead of two. Uh, so <laughs> it's, it's worth thinking that's, about those that's things. The, that's the, that's the, that's the deepest cut I've ever heard in terms of a value proposition. Oh my God. I need to start thinking about stuff like that, man. Okay. Um, anyways, uh, let's move on to skill plus two. Um, Skill plus two is not impactful. Like, we all know it's not impactful. It's three hit, and that's that's what it is. It's three hit, and it's uh, skill... Well, it, well, crit crit works in... It's skill minus four divided by two. So, I, let's just say that you've, you have more than four. It's going to be it's gonna be one crit. So, um, it's, it's okay. I think skill plus two is hard. And when I say hard, I mean hard. It is hard hard carried by the fact that it's an archer skill if it was in any class that was like even slightly worse than archer it would be like utter dog water but the fact that archer is all about having good hit rates i think skill plus two is i mean i think it's, like, I think it's okay uh, the, the, it's definitely like the first skill that i would unequip on an archer unit if i have more than five skills but i think it's fine yeah uh, basically i agree um uh, i don't care about the crit at all i like having plus three hit that's great um and yeah, i think you're right that it is it, its value is pushed up a lot by the fact that it's on archers and um, bow units are particularly good at providing dual strikes. There's, they have a lot more flexibility with positioning in, in most cases. Um, so, but dual strikes don't get a lot of hit bonuses, so you appreciate having a lot of accuracy on your support unit. Um, and like that's nice. Yeah, it's the first skill I would ditch as soon as I get something better. Uh, but it's it's perfectly fine. Three hit. I think I appreciate if I make Archer Mozu, I'm like, cool. Three points more accuracy. Um, yeah, that, that seems. I think we're, I think I, I like, like looking at this, I feel like we're underrating shove and swap, but yeah, <laughs> I, we're just going to leave, we're just going to leave it where it is and just uh, deal with the backlash if it, yeah, if it ever occurs. Um, all right, next up is quick draw. I mean, oh baby, quick draw. Quick draw is quick draw by itself can turn people into a unit. Mosu without quick draw is like, okay, I mean this is an okay unit. Mosu with quick draw is like, oh my god. Who who like wh who are you and what did you do to my weird uh, villager girl? It is plus 4 damage on initiation and the, there is, that's it. Like, plus four damage on initiation. The Fate's Death Blow actually only gives you crit. I believe it's the first instance of Death Blow in the series, so they were still trying to work mm -hmm. it out. Later on, they made it much better with uh, damage, like in three houses. Um, but uh, this is this is the proto-Death Blow, and damn, is it good. I mean, it's on Archer, and Archer is already about player face. Like, if you're doing enemy face stuff with Archer, you're, you're probably only doing it in situations where you already have enough damage output to make it work. But on player phase, so quick draw can make you into an absolute menace. Um, there's there's a lot of like kind of bulky enemies in the early game that have either a bunch of HP or a bunch of defense. For example, like like uh, spear fighters um, in the early game, they can be kind of difficult to deal with. They their their naginatas give them defense. They have a solid speed stat. Uh, they they can sometimes be paired up. They're pretty kind of, they're kind of annoying to deal with. But then you come up with a quick draw and you stack enough speed to double them, and those guys are just dead. They're just dead. Um, it's there is there are maybe like I could uh, there are less than ten skills on this list that I would take over quick draw. So that should that should speak to you about how much I like quick draw. But again, it doesn't change the way you like the meta. It doesn't change how you play the game, right? It's not. It's not really like. It, it, it's just. It just makes a. It makes a either good unit or a, kind of mag unit a lot, lot, lot better. 
And uh, I think the how much better it makes them puts in always worthwhile for me. Uh, yeah, plus four damage is a lot. Um, and actually, I think we may, uh, it is player phase only. Um, but I think there's like many, many situations where that plus four is, is a huge deal. It, it comes pretty early. Uh, you can stack it with a bunch of other things uh, later on. It's, it's a big bonus. And like I mentioned before, on archers in particular, they have pretty good prospects for dual striking, and this gives you plus two in all their dual strikes as well on player phase. Um, I'm, I'd be tempted to put these kinds of skills all up in meta-defining. And the distinction I would make from magic plus two in particular is just that it's more broadly applicable. Like, uh, there aren't yeah, that many characters. Yeah, just damage. Yeah, there, there aren't that many characters who are going for like a magic damage build. Um, and <laughs> I would, I would, I would disagree with you on that one. Well, uh, that, just because well, there's I a should, lot of characters in the game. Yeah, well, there aren't that many that would go through, would go for magic plus two, and are like viable enemy phase combat units. Uh, yeah, who, it's who like, can get a lot it's of like Leo, Super Ophelia, Odin for like like the early to mid. Yeah, if, if you give everything to Odin, it. he can make use of it. Um, it, it's possible on like, like if you trained up Hayato or something, um, he can he can use it well. Or Rinka if you go magic and you get like Orochi friendship. Um, but there are several other skills in a similar vein that have both a stronger effect, and they're on like they're easier to combine with other uh, with other similar skills, like magical units. Several of them, like beyond like Leo and sort of Odin, have a good amount of trouble going into physical classes and getting skills from there. Whereas, like if a physical unit has a bunch of different class, like base classes that each have a damage boosting skill, that can be very very powerful. Yeah, it's it's the same the reason as like going into tramp, uh, going into malignite. You might not necessarily use the magic, but you're sure as hell are going to make value out of trample. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, all right, here we have, uh, even, here we have, uh, even-handed, and then that's it for the Hoshido exclusive skills in tier one. Uh, even-handed is, uh, extra damage on even turns. I don't know how to feel about this. The thing is, like, I want to say that it's unreliable, but it literally isn't unreliable. You can guarantee that it's there every other turn. So it just boils down to how flexible is your strategy, and how long are you willing to wait. And for me... My strategy is pretty flexible, but I am not willing to wait. So I'm, I would just put it into... I, I would put it into, like... I would put it into... I don't want to put it into niche because it's free damage, right? Free damage is so good. I, I would have to put it above, like, aptitude. Like, at the most. For me, at least. Yeah, I might I might go a little bit higher. Um, the only... Like, I, I think both of these... Uh, Wolfskin and Kitsune skills, the... Um, the, yeah, this one's even-handed. The other one's odd-shaped. Um, they can both be very, very strong. It's plus four damage, I believe, um, for both of them. Just like quick draw, except it works on both phases. It's just every other turn instead. Um, the only problem with it is, um, uh, like the timing can not not work out sometimes, and um, I, I really hate to ding a skill for player error. Like, because I guess theoretically you want to rate things on the assumption that you're always going to make the right moves, but it is one of those things that's really easy to forget about, uh, so that you're either not taking it into account or you don't realize it's going to do something for you. And sometimes those surprises aren't good. Um, uh, there is there is one thing I will say. This is a very good that even hand and odd shaped are skills that make very solid use of the ability to switch between two different solid combat units. Like if you have Keaton and Camilla or something, you can swap. You can have Keaton just do go into combat on even turns. I mean on odd turns and Camilla go into combat on even turns. Th to be fair, Camilla going into combat on all turns is probably going to be a better value uh, proposition for you. But still, like you can do stuff like that. Yeah, you, you can make a specific plan to make very good use of these. Um, I would probably put them... I'm torn between, like, myself saying between bottom of always worthwhile and towards the high end of nice to have. 
Um, you know what? I'm I'm willing to put it in bottom of always worthwhile for the world's worst reason, and that is that the tiers are super uneven. Uh, so, <laughs> well, not to worry because I I think I'm going to be more enthusiastic yeah, about think, more than Nordian. I think we're going to have to, a lot out, more but... to worry about with the structure later on than just the being a bit uneven. Okay, uh, next up is Beast Bane. Beast Bane is kind of a it's kind of a weird one. It's 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 very wide. It's widely ap- applicable but hard to access. Like, Beast Bane gives you two times uh, effective damage on all beast enemies. And beast enemies is uh, horse enemies um, and the fur, uh, like uh, the furry enemies, so uh, Kitsune, wolf's, uh, Wolfskin, Wolfsegners, uh, Ninetales, and also all uh, Pegasi enemies, so Sky Knights, kin- uh, and, and uh, I guess Kinshi enemies, so Sky Knight, Pegasus, uh, Falcon Knight, and Kinshi Knight. So it doesn't work against Wyverns, and uh, that's the- basically the only mount that it does not work against. Mm-hmm. I think it's it's good, but it's only on those. It's only on Kitsune and uh, Wolfskin, and their and and their like specific, uh, and their offspring. So it's it's kind of limited. Yeah, I would say it's a nice to have. Um, it is only double the weapon might, not triple might, like other kinds of effectiveness. Um, so it's not a huge bonus, um, which cuts both ways, really. Like on the uh, Kitsune chapter in Conquest, chapter nineteen. Uh, that does mean that Keaton doesn't get absolutely destroyed by the enemy uh, Ninetales. He, he can actually use this if you want to. Uh, I would actually, I would actually put something out there that I actually don't think that it's the fact that it's two X and not three X that holds it back, and it's the fact that uh, the way that effective weaponry is designed in Fates inherently holds it back. Effective weaponry in Fates has its stats pushed so hard because if you use it against somebody that's not good against, then it's going to get minus four might penalty and minus ten hit. So they're able to put those high stats on weapons. But when every weapon is an effective weapon, you don't get the extra pushed stats, so you don't get to make more value out of it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the effective, the normal effective weapons have really good stats when they're used against the right enemies, whereas the, the stones are not that awesome as weapons, and they're unforgeable, which is a problem a little bit. Um, one thing I should have mentioned with uh, Even-Handed is um, it would never be worth going into one of these beast classes on someone who didn't come with a, to- with a stone rank, but the good news is everyone who can access them does come with one, because the only, the only child... Well, okay, that's not true, because Shigure can actually get um, Wolfskin or um, Kitsune. Uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think he can, actually. I, I think he just gets Fighter. No, he, he, or, uh... he inherits it. Like, the, the kids who are... <laughs> you could have Wolfskin. Yeah. You could have Wolfskin Shigure. That so, sounds so good. So I, I would never ever send Shigure through these classes, because he has no stone rank to work with. But Kana, if, if you get a Kana who, is one of these, who has access to one of these, uh, Kana does come with stone rank. Uh, Dragonstones and Beast stones work off the same weapon rank, uh, so that is viable if you want to go that route. I still wouldn't recommend going into the classes necessarily because they have pretty good stats, but they're one range locked and foot locked. And I mean, the, the reason you go into Wolf Segner is because it has a good pair up. Like, let's be realistic. Yeah. So if you have a bad, like a weak Kana, it can be like that can be a viable thing for Kana's go. The deal. class is wild, but the pair up is even more wild yeah. basically. That's like it, it's it's good, but um it's it's held back by the fact that it's better as a backpack class. Um mm. anyways, let's move on to elbow room. This is a skill Norian that I think I also time. Oh yeah, Norian skills. This these skills are uh they are oh I I I have a lot more to talk about here. I love I love every single one of these skills actually. Yeah, wait, dude, I, all these how are dude every single one of these skills is a banger. How, wait, what? Well, uh, not all of them, but I would say broadly speaking, the Norian base classes yeah, I, have there, incredible there's some, there's skills. Some, there's some duds here, but uh, yeah, no elbow room. I think I rated a bit less than uh, the average person. Like, I don't think it's bad. There's just no way in hell you can say that like three damage on non-terrain when most of the game is non-terrain is bad. No, it's good. But I don't think it's like I don't think it's like defining because again you have to have access to Cavalier, um, and if you are putting the work to like put somebody into a different class to get more damage dealing, uh, more damage dealing potential, there's probably better options that you have for damage dealing. Like if you need more damage, I guess you you can go life and death. You can go for a fair skill. You can go for trample. You can go for quick draw. You can go for hell, even handed odd shaped if you if you have the access to it. You know, you can go for uh, you can go uh, like you can go for a bunch of other stuff. And elbow room might not necessarily measure up. However, if you have elbow room, 
you're a unit that's basically just does more damage. I, I think it, I think it's I think it's the very top of always worthwhile, and you will and nothing will ever take it off of its throne. Uh, well, I'm going to be one of those people who says it's way better than that. It's better than quick draw, in my opinion, for sure. Um, one of the things that really makes this incredible is that it's a level one skill. So you get it like almost immediately if you go into Cavalier. Every Cavalier you get starts with it, including Silas when he's like level six at the beginning. He's got elbow room. Um, it works for level like 17 in Revelation. Yeah, sure. Um, it works for the entire game. There's, there are few situations where you're, where you're going to be relying on terrain yourself. Um, especially in conquest, most of the terrain is positioned to help the enemy and not you. Um, like it's gates and thrones and stuff. And there's not, it's like there's occasional woods tiles and stuff, but there's just not uh, that much. Elbow room is not going to do you any favors on chapter 19. Let me tell you that much. But other than that, you are good for the entire game. Yeah. Um, yeah, in chapter 19, it's probably better for you to stand on mountains than to stand in the open fields, even if you can. Um, but it's, it's three damage in basically every situation for the entire game. It's really, really, really good. And the fact that you get it early, or if you don't start with it, you can pick it up really fast. Um, it makes it so it's viable to go, like, there's a good reason to for characters like Camilla even to like switch into Cavalier line for one level just to get this and then go out. Yeah, but there's a good reason for Camilla to switch into anything because anything that makes Camilla even slightly better is going to make your army so much better because Camilla is so like game defining. Yeah, well, I'll have a bit more to say about that when we get to some of the promoted skills as well. Um, oh yeah, but uh, uh, yeah, you know I, what? I, I'm willing to put it in meta defining, but I'm not. I don't. I don't want to put it over. Ugh, fine, I'll, I'll do it. I. I see the three value. damage all the I time the is value. better than four damage on player phase. It, it just is. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, now, oh, shelter. I don't know how to think about shelter. Shelter is another uh, playstyle dependent. It's playstyle dependent thing, right? But I, I think that uh, the thing with shelter is that like shelter trains to get more dances each turn. I think that if you are a newer player, I think you should put in the work to learn how to do that. Even if you don't make use of it, I think you should put in the learn work to learn how to do it because sometimes you might notice that, hey, I can probably do a shelter train here and do some like cool stuff this turn. And I think that it is like the very top of nice to have because like it's not always going to be worthwhile because let me tell you, like if I have to choose between having like soul or uh, shelter on Xander, I'm going to pick soul 100% of the time. But um, it's very nice to have. Yeah, if I were thinking about shelter only from the, the obvious perspective, like to save a unit who needs to be saved, I would agree with that ranking. I would say it's like very nice to have, but you can, you know, if you know what you're doing, you don't need it. Um, but I would personally put this at the very top of this list. It might be the best skill in the game. And it's entirely because of shelter singing, um, which if you know what you're doing is stupid. There's so many silly things you can do by like refreshing two, three, four times a turn. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I think I'm just underrating it because it, 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 it pisses me off whenever I try to figure out a strategy and then it fails because I forget to remember one specific thing. Uh, yeah, but, you've got to yeah, have the things lined I, I, up. Um, it's... I, still, I still think that making the run not be a challenge run is better than having free dances uh, every turn if you position properly. Okay, you can put it that way. Um, okay, defense plus two. When are you not going to want to have defense plus two on a unit? That's like, if you have a free slot, like defense plus two is always going to be useful and it's always going to be like, you, you will see it. But you will see it like putting in work and it's a level one skill and it's on armor knights but you can just marry somebody like with an armor knight and get it or you can just like be married to an armor knight get access to it go into great ninja as a like a cavalier great and ninja. then like a great ninja yeah great great knight as a cavalier uh, and uh get get it along with uh um is, is this is it called indoor fighter in no that's awakening no natural it's cover. natural cover yeah 
yeah. Uh, I, I just think it's a good skill. Like, I think it's, I think, I, I think it's always worthwhile to have. Honestly, like, I think uh, if we're gonna put magic plus two here, we sure as hell should put defense plus two up here. Uh, well, I can answer your first question, which is when do you not want this? Uh, and that is sometimes I take it off of Effie in chapter ten because she's too strong and she doesn't take damage from the ninjas or the spear fighters. <laughs> right. Yeah, that actually happens to me with Silas occasionally. I usually use Silas to tank that area. Um, I think. To me, there's a distinction to be drawn between the damage boosting direct stat increases and the defensive ones. Um, and that is that the damage ones, the damage boosting ones, it, this, could de- this could change depending on what the exact stat tribu- distributions are in a particular game, but with the way the stats are in Fates, it matters more to get higher offense than it does to get extra defense from these skills. Like, don't get me wrong, um, putting, like, a ton of defense can be really helpful. Like, I like stacking defensive auras, and defense plus two is a good skill. Um, it just, it makes a greater impact on what you can do with your turns to be able to hit kill thresholds than it does usually to take a bit less damage. I think you're, I think you're underestimating how much the late game of Conquest can turn into figure out who I'm able to juggernaut with and try to optimize it as much as possible. Yeah, but the characters who are best at that don't generally get knight access. It's not something you, you'd want to go out of your way for. Um that's 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 true to some extent. Like with HP plus five, that's on that's on that's on that's on all three of the best backpacks in Conquest. So any like juggernaut unit is going to have access to HP plus five with just one reclass and one level. So, like, that's the difference. To, but with defense, too, I can see why you would not want to win it. I still think it's at least always worthwhile. Like, stat boosting, st- like, stat boosting skills are just, like, they give you stats, right? Yeah, and it, it is immediate. Uh, like, I, to continue the discussion with the upcoming skills, I think this is certainly better than natural cover. Just like I mentioned before, you don't get to make as much use of terrain as you might hope yourself. Um, and it's, it's, yeah, it's just not as applicable as yeah, sometimes you get you get to be on a gate with natural cover and you get six defense, three res, and you feel like the god of the world. But like you can't do that time, sometimes. Yes. Yeah, on like chapter thirteen with Benny, you can just absolutely destroy people. But like other than that, you're never gonna. It's not just not gonna work. Yeah, I, yeah. I think I, I think this is fair. Um, maybe like this, maybe like the. Yeah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I'm willing. To, I'm willing. To, I think. I think. I think this is this is a bit more fair to defense plus two for from a from even from a like a newcomer and a like a middle like a like a, a middlingly good player's perspective. Mm-hmm. It's just a lot more safety. Yeah. So certainly uh, for natural cover, I think that's down a tier. Yeah, um, I think. I think that natural cover. It is, might even be niche, honestly. Because I, I, I think. I think. I don't think natural cover is niche because. Because like the use case is, it, it's it's very easy to see what the use case is, and especially Benny, for example, can make very good use of it. So yeah, I mean Benny has problems I think, I sometimes think, with having too much defense, though. Um, um but not, like well, that's this thing, right? If you if you get him at chapter like you can get Benny on chapter thirteen, bench him, unbench him on chapter nineteen, give him a beast killer, and somehow he's taking like less than a third, like l- l- less than like half of his HP from the promoted enemies. Yeah, Benny. Uh, like, Benny is one of the easiest solutions to chapter nineteen. That's true. Yeah, it's 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 Benny and Xander basically, and I like you can. It's it's very easy to see where you would use it, when you would use it, how you would use it, and I, I just think from that like from that like vision perspective, I think I think it deserves to be at least a nice to have. Okay. Uh, now we move on to HP plus five. I think HP plus five is, uh, I think as, like aside from maybe movement plus one. <clears throat> I think HP plus five is the best um, flat stat buff skill, straight up. Um, HP plus five in a, in like most Fire Emblem games would be like meh, but this is not most Fire Emblem games. This is Fire Emblem Fates, and Fates has no HP. Like units are lucky if they have fifty percent HP growth in this game. HP plus five is a massive change in a unit's HP. Like, uh, like your Camilla is going to have I don't know, like f- maybe forty HP at end game. Uh, at most, like that's 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 if you that's if I'm being super generous, like, uh, it, like uh, Camilla, fifty uh, percent plus nine, yeah, yeah, that's gonna be like, she, yeah, she's gonna be like forty HP at end game when you really want to be hitting at least like forty five to fifty, and and the best part about HP plus five, I think, is the fact that it's on berserkers, and 
all of the good backpacks in Conquest have access to Berserker. Keaton's a second class is Berserker. Uh, Arthur is a Berserker. Sheldon is a Berserker. And it just, it just comes with, like, the... It just comes with it. And you can go into Hero instead of Berserker if you want to, like, off of the partner seal to get access to Soul, uh, especially with Xander. That's yeah. really good. And, like, I just... HP stacking is going... Is, is like, if you can do it and... Um, if you can do it, it's so good, and HP plus five is one of the easiest ways to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think HP plus five is a really big bonus. Um, it's it's very good, um, and like you said, there are HP is relatively low in this game compared to all the other stats. It's not really that low compared to some other Fire Emblem games, but it's the what happens in Fates is like. HP is in the 30s and 40s mostly, especially for most of the characters who aren't like late game pre-promotes. For whatever reason, they gave later pre-promotes pretty good HP, generally speaking. Um, but your like offenses are also around that area. So what happens is you take a big chunk of your overall HP when you get hit in a lot of cases. Uh, so HP can be HP bonuses can be very valuable. Um, I would probably I would probably put this above Magic plus two and maybe below inspiring song oh yeah I'm, 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 i would not put it above inspiring song because inspiring song just makes your life so much easier mm -hmm. uh, gamble gamble can is, i lead off okay. with this oh yeah go for it please go for it it's the worst skill in the game by far it's probably the only one that actively hurts you um mm. and i that may sound harsh because lots of people have lots of fun with crit stacking builds but this is like the only skill in the game where I will level up my fighter to level 10 and I will be sad that I did. Um, because it just murders oh, yeah. it murders their hit rates and crit stacking just isn't that good in fates. Um, the absolute best you well, can... Well, in Conquest. In definitely, Conquest, definitely. But, but even in Birthright, like you can get the Great Club and stuff uh, with, again, horrible hit rates. Um, like The very best you can do to stack crit is basically... I mean, technically, Charlotte gets like plus twenty against female opponents, but there are so few female enemies in the one. I've she done. Can... I've done a great club. Uh, I've done great club Baruka, and it actually ends up uh, in Rev, and actually ends up being pretty solid. Yeah, Baruka has good skill, which helps. But and Rev, Rev is sort of a unique situation because enemy quality overall is pretty high. Like the main thing they did with Rev enemies is they just made their stats good. Um. But the best you can do is like. Killer Axe Arthur, who gets Oni access and gets Death Blow, and then he ends up with like 80 to 85% crit rates, which is like fine, but it's. There are so many way better things you can do with your builds than try to instantly kill At things. that point, I would just go all the way, just do it with Elise and get try to get as low hit as possible. <laughs> yeah, but the, uh, the catch is like you're really investing into the wrong thing if you're trying to go for a crit build because you can just get straight up damage and one shot things that way and you have like 100 percent accuracy if you pick the right weapons for that like mm -hmm. there's just no real purpose to having a lot of crit so what yeah. gamble does for you is it just crushes your hit rates it makes it makes charlotte so much more annoying to train if you if you try to feed her kills in chapter 13 when she joins in conquest cuz she's already oh, level dude, 10 you want to talk you you try try le try using arthur when he's like level 9 and then he levels up to level 10 on chapter 10 and then try using him dude, yeah God, i man, i generally painful. try to manage my experience so that arthur is gaining reaching level 10 towards the end of a battle so that i don't have to deal with that um, oh yeah well i don't mind if he's reaching it to, like in the middle of the battle i just don't i just don't want to i just don't want that battle to be chapter 10 yeah um, yeah, but overall, this is the worst skill. It just hurts you in pretty much every case where yeah. it, it might be even slightly relevant uh, when, okay. it, when it comes up, and then it doesn't do anything I, for you. I agree, but I think it's better than Foreign Princess. That's what, that's what I'm going to put out there. Um, I've used Gamble once to some funny effect. I used it. I put it on Xander once with, when he was doing soul stuff, and it was pretty funny. Um, and actually was kind of helpful against some generals when they didn't do much damage to him, he didn't do much damage to them. The crit kind of helped uh, p p make the difference, so I, I didn't have to spend seven turns waiting for him to kill a general. Um, 
I, I refuse to put anything below foreign princess, basically. Well, I, we may have to agree to disagree on that, but I'd rather have a totally empty skill slot that does nothing than put gamble on someone. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I would rather have I would rather have the option to put gamble and then choose not to put gamble than have a skill that does nothing. It would be nice if gamble were a command still, but it's not. Um, yeah. Like if you can just decide um, okay. oh, I want to risk it for the crit, sure, whatever. That's silly, but you know, you do you. We're getting our uh, we're getting our bad skills out of the way right now, and here's good fortune, the other um, the other extreme dud of the conquest munch. It's luck percent to heal some HP at the start of your turn, and why would you ever use this? Like even camaraderie is in night bottom of nice to have, so why would I want a worse version of that? Right, like it's 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 luck percent chance not even luck times two it's luck percent if it was luck times two then we'd be onto something because that's like you can hit like 60 percent chance to trigger but it's luck percent and it's only 20 percent of your hp um i i like you i could say it's worse renewal but renewal is way harder to get than good fortune so i'm just not going to bother saying that i'm just going to say it's a bad skill um well going back to what i said about camaraderie i think i'm a little bit higher on these minor healing skills than most people um like yeah, you're not really going to be able to rely on this. And it's it's sort of like Duelist Blow in that way, where it, like what it does for you is sometimes, once a turn, it lets you end up with more HP than you otherwise would. Um, to me, they're about equivalent, honestly. Um, it can... Yeah, like it, it, it has to be worse than Camaraderie, because it's just yeah, so it's much Yeah, it's worse than Camaraderie, variety. for sure. Um, like, there's no way you're going to get enough luck to make the 20% luck percent more than 10 percent within three when you're within good three fortune spaces. midori now we're talking <laughs> uh yeah fun meme builds um but yeah like it, it buys you some action efficiency sometimes and it's basically never going to mess you up uh we've mentioned a couple times that there are situations where you don't want to heal over a threshold usually in relation to advantage or valor friendship um so just don't equip those this skill on people who care about that, which most of the units who do that don't really go through. Don't really go through mercenary, yeah. or if they do, they already have enough skills that they're not even going to have to equip this. Also, I love the fucking balls that the dev had devs had to put good fortune on Gazak. Like they had the <laughs> opportunity to put any skill on Gazak, and they were like, "Yeah, let's give him good fortune." Like I get it, he has a big HP, but come on, man. Well, good I fortune. I think that's a bit of a joke about Arthur. Um. Oh, because Percy right, mistakes you know him for Gazak, and it turns out that um, Gazak has good fortune, and Arthur's Arthur has terrible luck. Mm -hmm. You know what? That 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 makes a lot more sense now that I think about it. Yeah. Um, do you want to talk about stronger post first, or do you want me to talk about it? Uh, you can lead off. Okay, this is a skill that I don't use nearly as much as I should. Like, I just don't use Stronger Post as much as I should. I am ashamed to admit it. I think I... I, I like, the, the most that I use Stronger Post is, like, on Chapter 12. That's, 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 that's when I consistently use it. I... Like, you look at it on paper, it's good. And I'm sure that in practice it's good. I just don't use it because most of the time the units that I find, like use in this class line, again, it's a mercenary class line. It has to be mercenary class line, so you can't get it off of uh, you can't get it from like berserk uh, from like a uh, fighter into hero or something. You have to go from mercenary. So it's Selena, Laszlo, and um, Corin maybe, and then like people that can friendship with those people. Um, I just find myself like I just find myself not enemy phasing with Laszlo. If I'm using Laszlo, I'm turning him into a bow knight. I'm using him to shit on flyers, or I'm using him to use armor slayers to kill uh, armors and ha abuse the fact that bow knights get four speed on promotion. If I'm using Selena, it's basically the same same exact deal, except with hero and getting some good bulk off off of it. I just like this is definitely a me problem, but I just don't use strong opposed that much. Um. Yeah, I can sort of see where you're coming from. Um, it's Stronger Post is one of those things, it's a bit like uh, even-handed and odd-shaped, actually, in that it's somewhat easy to forget about it, um, because especially because you don't see it if you're if you're the kind of player who like moves their units around and checks the battle forecast to see if they're going to kill something, because uh, that you, you can only do on player phase, so it's not going to show you what you get from Stronger Post. So that's one way you can forget about it pretty easily. Uh, it is extremely strong, 
particularly on bills that are already going for like some kind of like primarily en- enemy phase combat setup. Like if you can, if you can get this on a Ninja, Xander doesn't really need it that much, but you know it can help. I mean, if you, you could do Lazlo Xander A plus, get him into Bow Knight, and then eventually get Shuriken Breaker if you really want to get fancy. Yeah, but you, yeah, I you can don't. you can do stuff with that. Um, I think used well, and like if you're keeping if you're keeping these skills in your thoughts optimally, it's better than Quick Draw. Um, Otherwise, it's a little bit worse than Quick Draw, uh, but I still think it's a very, very strong skill. Um, I don't actually actually kind of disagree with that conceptually because it's so much easier to conceptualize the fact that archers get damage when they attack. That makes sense, right? You use archers on player phase, okay? Mercenaries and being bulky, like like I get it. But there's also there's also mercenaries across the franchise that aren't that bulky, like Raven. He doesn't have bulk to. He doesn't have shit for bulk, right? Um, like it, it's 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 a bit less. It's a bit less like easy to. It, it's a bit harder to formulate that process in your head. So definitely for your player, I wouldn't say it's that good. But even then, like making the leap, you have to reclass. Like like as a as a mercenary, as a hero or a bow knight, how often? Are, like I don't think you're going to be able to make use of stronger posts that often because of that like critical lack of one to two range. As mm. and so like you have to reclass to make like great use of it but literally by existing as an archer and just doing normal archer things you're making good use of quick draw there is there are zero hoops to jump through there is zero process it, it is just that way sure but i think you're i think bow units are criminally underrated as enemy phase units especially in conquest um and if you're just going like merc into bow knight even if you're doing like nothing special with your build or anything um it can be pretty useful, like, um, like Selena. Oh, don't get me wrong. I've used it on Chapter Thirteen. Like I've used yeah. like to promote Laszlo to yeah. Yeah, like Laszlo can do work if you promote him to Bow Knight in Chapter Thirteen. Uh, you can use a Bow Knight really well in Chapter Twelve against the ninjas across the walls, and likewise in Chapter Seventeen, for example, um, Bow Knight Selena. Like Insta promote Bow Knight Selena just barely hits the speed threshold to do well in that chapter. And um, no. strong repost uh, makes it very easy for her to hit the kill thresholds along with the speed threshold um, against all the ninjas. Um, and in general, Selena hits the speed threshold at base. That's wild. Yeah, I need to start using Selena more, man. Yeah, she hits. Uh, I believe it's eighteen at base in Bow Knight, and basically you can stack uh, on top of that. You can get three from uh, Inspiring Song, two from the Tonic. Two from a meal up to two, one from Laszlo, so that's eight. Um, so that's twenty six, and then she just needs three from a pair, of, like generic berserker or even unpromoted Keaton. Or if like you need one more oh. speed, or you couldn't you only get one from the meal or something, you can get promoted Keaton to do it um, to get to twenty nine, and that's what you need to double the master ninjas. Dang, like even doubling the ninjas on the map is pretty solid. Like that's okay. That that's something I need to keep in mind for my future chapter seven chapter seventeen clears. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, and I can I, I can see like I can see like there are there definitely is a lot of uh, enemy attacks you from across the wall, so you really don't care about who is like on the other side of that as long as they have to access to at least two range. Um, yeah, I, I'm I'm willing to put it above. Uh, I'm willing to put it above. Yeah, just one thing I want to add to that, which is um, the general flow of combat, and I'm, I'm going to speak more about Conquest here than the other routes, just because I have more experience with it, and I think it's more more applicable to it, but there's like really three different approaches you can have. And one is like the classic bait and swarm thing, where you put one unit at the edge of enemy range, and then you draw in a group, and then you kill them all in player phase. And bows work really well for that, because um, late in the game, there's a lot of groups. A lot of enemies have mixed ranges. Like even the physical enemies will have quite a few spears or whatever. Oh yeah, there's like there's like Basaras and Oni chieftains yeah. and whatnot. Yeah. I'm so a lot of times, if you're camping on the edge of range and you're trying to counter and kill something, you're better off having a two range weapon than you are having a like a hand axe um, or a one range weapon, of course. Um, so bows can be helpful for that. And then 
there's like the faster strategy, well, the usually faster strategy where you try to put together like some kind of juggernaut and send them into the group and then go kill things, in which case bows are not that important. But then there's like a level beyond that where you go in and wipe out a, a group of enemies and try to push past them to the next group all in the same turn. Like, especially if you're doing shelter singing shenanigans or you would just have like a bunch of really broken builds to go through with things. Um, and in that case, like bows become really great at enemy phase again, because now you're taking care of one group and then like baiting the second group behind them. Um, so there's a sort of fluctuation in how efficient they can be. Um, but generally, I would say for most purposes, it's actually better to, to be enemy phasing with two range than it is to be enemy phasing with one range. And it's better to be, and it's even better than most forms of one, two range. I, I would disagree on the one to two range, but I can see the two range versus one range argument. Um, because there's some, there's some dumb tomes in this game. Yeah, and then there are daggers. Yeah. And there's Siegfried. Um, oh, yeah. And, and there uh, are magic weapons. Mm-hmm. Can't Those are all ten, good, ten might, but... Yeah, 10 might 80 hit on a... And, like, 5 crit, 10 crit avoid on a 1 to 2 range weapon that deals mad damage to an opponent's res is kind of... It's pretty good. Yeah. Okay, uh, next is movement plus 1. I mean, come on, it's movement plus 1. I don't know if it's like meta defining because it's not like you're it's not like it's not like your like clears are changed too often based on like the fact that oh I have one extra movement but like there is no way that I am putting this skill anywhere below the top of always worthwhile. Yeah, I could I could see maybe some quibbles with this in relation to some of the other skills, but that seems basically fair. It's really nice. I think some people actually underrate the power of high movement. Um, and that's fluctuated. I remember back in the day where everyone said sure it should always be killed because boots were so much better. And then nowadays I see a lot more people saying you should never kill Shura because there's no use for the boots and he's he's awesome. Um and like I think there are very legitimate reasons to like stack a bunch of movement on things. And move, yeah, movement the, plus the, one. Like my 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 main like concept on that is that uh, like most pl- most players are like if you if you're asking for asking about whether you should be killing Shura or not, you are probably not good enough of a player to make as good of a usage of those pair of boots as you are going to be able to make like sh- use of Shura. Like Shura is going to give you more value than those boots are if you like if, if like if you if you are good enough of a player to make s- that much of a like a value out of those boots then you don't need to be asking about whether you want to kill Shura or not. You're already good enough at the game to figure it out for yourself. That may be a fair way to think about it, but I don't want to get too sidetracked. So for movement plus one in particular, yeah, it's a great early skill. Um, having extra movement is really nice. Uh, on Niles in particular, it's <laughs> it's one of the like one of his fantastic features is being able to run across like back and forth on chapter 10 really efficiently because of it. Um, and like it just helps him out for the rest of the game. Um, it's a good skill to have. I think this is a fine placement. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, you know what? Uh, we should we should do these. Uh, we should do the tier one skills, and then we can take a quick break. Yeah, I agree. Uh, let's move on to strength plus two. Strength plus two. You know what, Zoran? I'm going to let you go first on this one. Okay. Um, I'm trying to rate these sort of separately from their classes for the most part. I can think of it divorced from what class they have, but I, it does have to be said that this comes as a level one skill on Wyvern Riders, and Wyvern Riders are amazing. Um, I think Strength Plus Two probably belongs at the bottom of meta defining. And it maybe it seems surprising to put something that only gives you two points up there with Elbow Room and Strong and Stronger Post and Quick Draw, which give you three or four. Um, But one of the really powerful things with all of those skills is that they all come in Tier 1 classes, and a lot of the characters can switch, like can pick, can go from one of these class lines to the other one and and get like plus 5 or plus 6 damage by combining two of them really early on. and strength plus two 
plays into that while also being part of an amazing class to go into or to come from sometimes. Um, so I think, I think it is up there. While I agree with you, I just don't think that any I don't I don't think that everybody that's going to want to go into Wyvern is going to make as good of a usage of strength plus two. Some people are gonna go into Wyvern just because they want to go into Malignite, right? Like like Malignite Felicia is like this is unironic talking, right? Because you can Malignite Felicia can actually do some work because having that early access to trample is a valid strategy. And also you can do some like extremely dumb shit with like Rally defense, rally res, trample, demoiselle, imp- inspiration, and just do some extremely like wild nonsense with that. But also, like if you have like a like a late per- late reclass Elise, which I wouldn't ever recommend you do it late. I'd say early, but uh, like if you do it later on, like you're probably not going to be able to make up the difference in strength as easily as you are. Like you you could you probably just reclass her, promote her, and just call it. Um, I just don't think that like uh, while I understand the I, I understand the decision like I I'm a big wyvern guy like I always go I always say wyvern corn like over any corn but um I just don't think that it's that unilateral and that strong enough to be in meta defining if it was if it was more if it gave you more stats or it was more universal then I then I'd go for it but I just don't think it compares Okay, I'm not too torn up if you want to put it in like top of always worthwhile or something. Um, but my my stance is that I think it works in tandem with the other damage stacks up top. I, I obviously they work together, but like in competition, like you have Wyvern with this uh, with 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 strength plus two and lunge, which we're going to talk about, and then you have and then you have Cavalier with the two skills. At number two and number three, like you could you could understand why it's kind of a fierce race because even though flying is good, like these two skills are wild, right? Like and this this skill gives you more more than just two damage output. So you can, like there's there's there is a decision making process there. It's not as brain dead as some of these uh, as all of the skills at the top tier are. Sure. Uh, let's go to let's go to lunge. I haven't used lunge properly enough to comment enough on it, so I'm gonna let you go first on this one as well. Okay, uh, I would put this right below strength plus two. If if I'd gotten my way on strength plus two, I would have put it at the top of always worthwhile. Um, and that is because lunge lets you. Um, again, I'm gonna speak mainly about conquest here. Um, a lot of formations that you see among the enemies are designed to. Um, they're positioned very, very carefully so that the enemies work together in a particular way, like their ranges overlap in the right way, or there's a lunge chain that sends you like 13 spaces or something. And if you can lunge them instead, you can easily mess that stuff up. So there's a lot of situations where you can either like break something that the map was going to try to do to you, or you can like sneak to a part of the map that you weren't supposed to get to by using lunge. And Lunge is one of the best skills actually to take out of Wyvern um, because the devs sort of did account for it. Like, there's, I can think of several maps where you could lunge across a wall to get someplace where you're not supposed to be, except that there's a bunch of bow units on the other side. So they sort of thought about what happens if a Wyvern lunges through here? What they didn't account for was what if, like, Xander lunges through with Siegfried? Or. There's like funny things you can do with Ophelia if she inherits lunge or something like that, or like a ninja with lunge who goes through a wall. Like if you have grounded, like a, a good grounded enemy phase unit who can lunge, there's some really really stupid things you can achieve with it. Um, so my stance is it's on the basically near the top of always worthwhile. Um. I'm willing to believe you on this one, but I, I would really like I, I would really like to hear at least one example because like I, I just can't I just can't imagine a use case for it, but I'm sure that like you you're you're being so passionate about it, so there has to be a use case. I just can't think about it right now. So uh, yeah, one of like the, is there like an example? One of the things I really enjoy is um baiting some of the adventurers to the walls on the in the opening room in Nina's paralogue and then lunging them. So that you get out and into the side hallways, like 
four turns faster than you're supposed to. Oh my god. Okay. Okay. Yeah. You know what? You're right. <laughs> Fair enough. I see it. And there are. It's. Um, in maps with lunge chains, not so much chapter eleven, but like uh, with the ninja room, but um, mainly in chapter uh, like one of the ways you can break chapter twenty six is to lunge some of the spies you meet automata um, out of the way. Uh, so I think you're your... talking about chapter twenty five. Twenty five. Twenty five. Yes. Hans Sorry. Iago. Yeah, chapter twenty five. Um, like most of the the main game chapters, it's not really that important. Uh, in chapter seventeen, it can get you across some of the walls faster, and that can be fun too. Um, or chapter twelve, likewise. Chapter twelve is one of those cases where there are bow units hiding behind the pots, like there's a bunch of apothecaries up north. But if somehow you have someone with lunge who's not weak to bows, uh, that can get very funny. Um, yeah, there, there's just like many things you can do with it that you wouldn't really expect. Um, another example I really like is Soleil's Paralog, where you're starting in sort of the northeastern corner, and there are walls keeping you from going to the northwest or the southeast. And again, you, but there, there are enemies that, that start right next to those walls, so you can just lunge them on turn one. Yeah, I believe there are berserkers at the bottom. Yeah. I think maybe at the top you have to bait someone and then lunge them on turn two. But anyway. You might be able to do something like that on uh, what, what's, uh, what uh, Dwyer's Paralog too. But then again, you could just end the map instead. So Yeah, on Dwyer's Paralog, it's like, if you're going to do that, well, the, what, the place you're going to do it is right next to a door that you can just open. So it, right. it really Oh, right. I there. forgot. You can just open the door. Yes. For some reason, I expected the devs to be smart, and I usually just bait it with a ninja, and then I forget that you can just open the door. Um, okay, next up is Heartseeker, and I kind of want to talk about Malefic Aura and the same thing, because they're, like, they basically both do the same thing, which is make Dark Mage's lives a lot, 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 lot easier. These two are, I think, I think both these skills are always worthwhile, at least, because th this is plus two damage, but also it buffs your allies occasionally, uh, and this is just plus 20 hit when you're on one range, like, straight up. And it, it just makes your Nosferatu tanking so much easier. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm. I'm a little bit torn about how to rate these. Um, I I would kind of say I, Malefic Aura is worse than Strength Plus Two, uh, but I kind of think it's better than Movement Plus One, maybe. Um, Heart Seeker, I'm tempted to put in Meta Defining uh, because. Like it does so many things for your consistent consistency. Like, um, if you're going for the like the Hitaka capture, or you're trying to kill Ryoma in Chapter Twelve, and you haven't just like sent a single boss killer up there, like you're bringing your whole team, um, you can Heart Seeker him and make it a lot e a lot easier to kill him. Um, it helps you out against um, what's his name, Kotaro in Chapter Seventeen as well. Like, there's a, a good number of boss enemies that stand on gates or thrones and Heartseeker helps a lot um, and most of the time unless you're super uh, concerned about turns you have plenty of opportunity to bring up a dark mage or someone else who has Heartseeker and plop Even them by the you boss. are worried about turns you have so many ways to facilitate movement with the pair up system yeah generally you're not going to get there if you're like actually going for an LTC but yes, like if you're, if you're just trying to be like, I mean, I hate the term efficiency. I think it's, I don't really know how to, I don't want to get into that discussion. Um, but um, like it really helps you out for the, the essentials, just killing those bosses. And it's just, it's a great skill for like every combat situation. It just makes your attacks really consistent. Or in the case of Nyx, it makes your attacks reasonably consistent. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't want to be the guy to say it, but uh, yeah. Um, give me a second. I, I, I'll, I'll be right back. Before we get started on Rest Plus 2, I got to do something really quick. I'll be back in like a minute. Um, all right. Uh, let's start off with uh, Res Plus 2. Um, I'm just going to be completely honest. Uh, I think Res Plus 2 is probably the worst of the these things. Like, there's The thing is, Res Plus 2 is only easily available to characters that already have at least solid res. So like Felicia, Elise, I guess Jacob doesn't have terror. Uh, yeah, yeah have his isn't amazing. Um, but uh, 
and and putting characters into a class that uh, that gets res plus two is going to be a, a lot more of a pain than it's worth for the most part for like for like four characters that have bad res. So bad res characters, Xander comes to mind. Putting Xander into Butler is going to make your life so much harder than it needs to be. Um, putting uh, putting Baruka into uh, Maid is going to make your life a lot harder than it needs to be. Stuff like that. I just don't think it's. I just don't think it. And like what you're getting out of it is not that much. Like basically, what you're getting out of that is that chapter. Like maybe you're gonna. Maybe your life is gonna be a bit easier on chapter. Uh, chapter. Uh, what is it? Chapter 18 and chapter 26. Yeah, resistance's applicability is just a lot lower than def than defense. Um, I. I would kind of say this is still in the bottom of a nice to have. Like, I, w I certainly wouldn't say no to no to it. And I like it's it's good that Jacob gets it because it helps him out when he's fighting mages and makes him much more effective at it. Um, I like that at least gets to carry it over if you class change her early because, um, I mean, she has access. She's not going to be great against mages for a while, but uh, like once she finally gets tomes, um, and she gets like a huge res boost of going into Malig as well, like putting this on top. It's nice. It makes her much more effective. Um, it also like can cement Felicia as the go-to mage killer. Like, yes, your Felicia is going to have good res, but with res plus two, she's going to have stupid res. Yeah, her res growth actually isn't that amazing, from what I remember. It's because uh, none of her stats are. Um, but yeah, um, certainly it's one of the things that makes uh, Flame Shuriken and Felicia genuinely useful. Is that she is such a an efficient mage counter. Um, like, you can go into chapter 13 and have her kill um, Orochi's group. You can have her fight the sorcerers in chapter 16 and so on. Okay, yeah, well, here's, here's like, like, Strategist Felicia has uh, 14 res at level I know you're so a big fan of Strategist Felicia, yes. Yeah, I just like movement and stat and, and uh, heal utility yeah, on one, in really, one package. Yeah. It's just... Um, yeah. But, yeah, I think that's... Bottom of nice to have. It's a decent spot for Res Plus 2. Mm -hmm. um, Demoiselle and Gentilome. I don't really know the pro proper way to pronounce them. I don't particularly care. But uh, it's kind of weird because Demoiselle is definitely better than Gentilome yes. because there's not there's 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 less male there's less uh, there's less female characters in the game and there's more male characters in the game. And um, the male and yeah. that's that's just how it is. So that's barely true. The, I think the. The place that matters most is early on, and actually there are more female units who join early than male, um, because you get, uh, you're going to have Corrin, this Corrin will be the same either way, uh, then you'll have Elise, Effie, Nyx, and Mozu, and am I missing something? I mean, you're going to have Odin, Niles, Silas, Arthur. That's four right there. Yeah. Um, am I missing something early? Anyway, but beyond that group, you're going to get the Camilla group. I mean, then, yeah, you're going to get the, three women in Chapter 10, so... For Chapter 10 and Chapter 11, there are no more joiners until after Chapter 11. Uh, but the thing is, the male units who join early get more mileage out of Demoiselle than the female units get from jean -Tien. Uh, yeah, the, you don't get too many bulky female units outside of uh, Effie. Yeah, there's, like, Effie is the there's only... There's Effie who doesn't need it, and actually it can cause her problems if she has too much defense. And then and, there's Camilla, who also doesn't need it. Yeah, and, like, Mozu is not an enemy phase unit at, at this point in the game. She really can't be until... Well, you can make her one in Chapter 11, if you know what you're doing, in Chapter 12. Um, but very in the very early going, she's just getting all her action on player phase basically yeah and like so like selena is really the only like really good use case yeah and nix is the same way she is not an enemy phase unit except in like specific cases where she's like doubling and using fire on archers or something in which case like she takes one hit and then kills things back and jean team is not going to fix that I would say I would put I would put uh, Demzel right here, and I would put Jontiem right here. Like, personally, that that's just where I would put it. Um, I might kick Jontiem up a little higher. Um, like uh, above Res plus two. Yeah, I mean maybe even more than that. The thing is, it, it's it's like Voice of Peace, and that it's one of those things where you can combine it with several other things to be very powerful. Uh, 
But overall, Dim Wassel is, is better. Um, just has a bigger impact on like Silas and Odin and Niles. And I mean, like even late game, you can you can stack it with Xander to get him enough res to survive some really strong mage enemies. Yeah, and even Arthur has a claim on like enemy phase action very early on, just because he has a hand axe. Um, so it's not ideal, but you know you can put him to work in chapter eight if you want to, or even chapter nine against the archers. Um, All right, this is going to be the last one, and it's your video, so I'm going to let you finish this one off. Sure. All right. So this one is odd shaped. And we've already had the discussion with even-handed. It's basically the same skill, but I think it is slightly better, and that's because it works on turn one. So um, you can put it to your work immediately. You can do like your sick turn one planned out setup, and it will actually work for you then. Uh, and technically, it will be active on more turns of your playthrough than the than even-handed will be. <laughs> that's that's such an odd argument, but it's I guess it's, it, it is accurate. It's completely correct. You will never have more even number of turns than you will odd number of turns. Yeah. Um. Yeah, unless we have anything to add, that's going to be it for part one. Yeah. So this has been uh, quite a long discussion just for the part one uh, with the tier one skills. Um, we'll come back later and. And discuss part two, which is all the promoted class skills. Should be interesting. <laughs> yeah, that's going to be even longer than this, and we already took so long on this one. Yep. All right, so until next time, signing off. Bye.